Hey, what's up everyone? It's Sunday night, which means it's time to wind down your weekend with Bat City Combat Professionals. As always, I am your host, Shannon, aka Small Press Shan, and back with me to help me wind down the year is Wednesday Phil. What's up, Phil? I'm back. Where have you been? People people have been wondering, but tell the world where you were. Uh, I was in the darkness. <laughs> of what they call peak season, which is, you know, the time of the year when retail and everything surrounding retail is crazy busy. So I crawled into a hole and I worked a whole bunch and experienced the holidays in the sunshine. Are we the sunshine state? We are. Okay. In, in the sunshine state and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, read a lot of comics, just trying to get by, okay. just trying to make it to 2023. There you go. Well, you did. It turns it. out we are in 2023, so you made yes. it. Yes. Yes. But even though we're in 2023, I've been waiting for Phil to be done because, of course, I thought it was only fair to wait for Phil since he read all of these books with me all year long. <laughs> so uh, I've been waiting for Phil so that we could wind down uh, your entire year. So we uh, are going to talk about some of our favorite books. We're going to do 22 uh, top books of 2022. And then we're also going to talk about that this week's books, which wasn't very many, so don't feel overwhelmed. It's actually at the end, probably the same amount of books we talk about every week, possibly even less than the last two weeks. Um, so we're going to talk about those tonight. First up, though, we're going to talk about this wine. We have um, Red Dragon Wine. It's Bourbonia. 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 Um, and it is, it's a Tempranillo, and I'm going to taste it. I think I've had this one before. I don't know if we've had it on the stream, but I think I personally have had this Red Dragon. I don't think I've had it, because I would have remembered immediately being drawn to that Science of the Lamb sequel. <laughs> that would have been the first thing that popped in my mind when I saw that, and I don't, I didn't have that bit of deja vu. All right. So, I don't think I've had it before. Do you hate it? I don't hate it. Oh, look at that. A Tempranillo and Phil doesn't hate it. So. I don't hate it. That's impressive. Usually, usually Phil only likes those bourbon barrel aged wines. I'm I'm excited that the spicier end of the wine spectrum is it has appealed to you tonight in this wine. I think in 2023 I'm going to go out and try to educate myself a little bit more on the world of wine. Go to like a wine tasting maybe. It's so much fun. Yeah, I think that'd be enjoyable. Try a bunch of different stuff instead of just drinking one giant glass of wine. So you know. Yeah. I like it because, I mean, these are actually from wine tasting, these glasses. Oh, nice. And they usually give you about what you have in your cup right there so that you can take two or three drinks out of it. And you have, like, the first one where you kind of are like, I don't know what I just put in my mouth. And then you get that second drink where you get to actually kind of, like, evaluate it and yeah. see if you like it. And by the third drink, they expect you to, like, have decided one way or another if you like it. <laughs> they usually give you, like, a little – sometimes they'll give you a little paper – so that you okay. can write down, like, what your thoughts were on each mm-hmm. wine. Mostly because they want you to buy stuff at the end. Uh, so they need you to know which ones were your favorite. Uh, okay. But there's, like, usually no, also no obligation. Uh, Matt and I did a, a trip to Comfort, Texas, which is all wineries. And we went to all the different ones. And while we were there, um, I think in the end we tried 29 different wines that weekend. Wow. Um, That's a lot of wines. It was a lot of wines. But you'd go into a place and they'd say, like, oh, do you want to do the tasting? And it was... You know, four to six wines per per thing. And so we usually would just be like, yeah, you know what? Let's do it. And they'd say, like, are you more of a red person or a white person? And, you know, if you're like, oh, I like reds more, they usually give you, like, two whites that you might like. Hmm. And then they the rest they'll fill with things you like. We had some really interesting flavors. So there is wine for all over the spectrum. Um, I'm kind of curious to see if there's going to be any uh, orange-based wines here in Florida. Um, that like would be many, wonderful. Yeah. I can smell the oranges turning into orange juice every night from our balcony, actually, over at Tropicana, just down the street. So What a, what a dream. It's it's wonderful. Um, if you didn't know, I actually haven't been here in the last couple months, um, we have a cool partnership with Mysterium Escape Rooms. Oh, okay. Um, I know that's the thing that you like think is like super cool, and I don't know if you've been over I've there. I've always to try wanted it out. to try it, yes, but I'm I'm afraid to. This is the one, honestly. You should totally go over to Mysterium. It's in Sarasota, and it's right across from the Hollywood Movie Theater, so right downtown in Sarasota. Um, and they're amazing. First of all, they stream this every Sunday night. So, Sweet, there you go. Um, so I'm thank already... you, thank you, Nick, for uh, tuning in and for streaming it. And 
in the shop in the shop but uh it's cool because it's a cool like bar type atmosphere when you walk into the lobby and then there's um six escape rooms is it six or five Nick's here. He can just tell you. But I'm like, I could count. One, two, three, four, five, four, four. Okay. Nick, tell me how many escape rooms you have because I always get it wrong. Um, but there's so many cool ones. And Nick let us go through a bunch of them and see, like, how they were set up. And so that's pretty cool that we got to check them out. Um, and I think we should do that city night at the escape rooms someday because that would be super dope. So, Nick, you and I, we need to talk. And I hope you're feeling better. I heard that you weren't feeling well or your son wasn't feeling well. Somebody wasn't feeling well. So I hope whoever was sick is feeling better. Um, but if you take your Bat City receipt over to Mysterium, Monday through Thursday, they give you 20% off your, your game and experience. And if you bring your escape room ticket to Bat City at any time, we'll give you 10% off. So, uh, he has four and he's working on two. I knew there was more. Uh, uh, Nick said that he'll give you the friends and family discount if you find your way down there. So Okay. Um, can, you, can you do solo escape rooms? Can you go by yourself? Because a lot of the times when I have free time, it's when everyone else that I know is working, which is just really only you two. Yeah, um, fair. But I just, yeah. If I could do it alone and you're cool with uh, me taking a really long time, <laughs> you know. You're going to turn into Gert, and I hate Barry then. Like, it's 40 years, and you're still room. stuck in this room, like, trying to figure it out. Uh, I can't wait. I We're going to have a future comic called I Hate Mysterium that is just Phil being stuck in this escape room for the next 40 years. What, what would be the best part of that whole story is that the employees were just like, that one's closed off. Right. We're <laughs> He's still in waiting. there until he finds his way out. <laughs> someday. Someday he'll make it through. Um, I believe in you, Phil. So I don't. I I've, I've heard people talk about escape rooms, and they're they're kind of difficult sometimes. So yeah, and these themes are so cool though. Like he has an area nine four one, which oh. is the alien one, a wild wild west, tiki trouble, which actually just sounds amazing to me that I could be stuck uh, on the island, <laughs> and then a uh, freak show, which I I don't know that one sounds like it's probably the creepiest. Cause... Yeah, that one probably the one I would not choose to go alone <laughs> in. Nick's like that's the one we're giving you, Phil. <laughs> That would be torment. Uh, oh, stuck in that room. Yeah, absolutely. He said the whole house was sick, but they all recovered. Good. I'm happy to hear it. Uh, Just feel I could certainly let you try. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, but um, the other thing that's coming up that I want to mention is our buddies over at Ascura are hosting the Bradenton Punk Rock Flea Market on January 22nd. And uh, we're going to be out there. That is a Sunday. It's from 12 to 6. We're going to be over there chilling. We're going to have some comics. There is a lot of really cool vendors. Um, there is, I, I was in love with the fact that one of the vendors is the, the hot dog vendor they had at that show that time. And it was, they're vegan. So the name of the company is Naw Dog. And I was like, I'm in. I'm in. You, you nailed it. Um, but we're going to be out there. We're going to have some comics. Um, it's going to be a, a fun time. I think there's like six or seven bands playing that day. Um, obviously punk bands. Uh, it's going to be cool. If you haven't been to Ascura, this is a great time to go check it out. And if you also just can't make it that day, you should go check out Ascura every day because there's always something cool. They just had a play. Um, That's pretty cool. Like they had yeah. an actual play set up. And I was talking to Matt, their um, event manager and audio like engineer. And I was like, how is that working? And he said that there were some scenes that were set on the floor. And so that way they could, instead of having to try to move everything around onto the staging and everything like that, because of the way their stage is set up, that they could just, the scenes would suddenly be down on like the side of the stage or over mm. in a different spot. And so um, I thought it was really cool that they are trying like all kinds of different events. Matt was like, if it sounds dope, I'm going to let it, I'm going to set it up. So well, why not give it a shot and figure yeah. out what what's going to stick and you can turn it into a kind of a weekly or monthly event. Yeah, so Ascura, check them out, get a coffee soda, tell them Matt told you to have a coffee soda, they'll understand, um, and uh, just see a show there or something, it's great, there's something every, coffee and food in the morning, uh, get something with a jam, because Sarah makes the best jams, uh, and then at night it's a venue with some live music and alcohol, and I think they just recently were supposed to be adding charcuterie boards to their menu, and we were there on sample night, and it was so good, so... Um, it was a ridiculously good charcuterie board um, and way too cheap for what the, what they put on it. So um, check it out. 
Oscar is amazing. We love them. Um, and we're going to, I'm going to take a drink of some wine. Well, Phil, you want to jump in? What's our best of 2022? Why don't you kick us off? Oh, we're going to kick off. We're going to kick off. We're going to do, do, we're gonna do old first. It's because you're out with the old and with the new. That's fair. So we're going to start with best of 2022. I'm going to let Phil go first. Yes. Uh, and we're going to pop back and forth talking about books that we both thought were just incredible last year. And honestly, we've made this list together. So I think either one of us could fully do their this anytime. Yes, sir. Are they in order? Are you no, down? no, we're not uh, counting down. Yeah, I know. I couldn't really That's too decide much like an ultimate top book of the year. There were yeah. so many good ones. So it's just kind of like, here's a le- 10 or 11 of my personal favorites for the year. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of lists have been coming out. And they've been kind of interesting lists. Um, I don't know how I feel about Saga being on this list. Right. <laughs> our thing, our rule is that it had to start in 2022. Or it December just, of Of December 2021 is the last, like, the cutoff. Because we, if you could get an Eisner or anything like that because you were coming out for all of 2021, you don't count. So if you've been yeah. a book since 2014, you're not on our list. Not because you're not still great. But because we're going to talk about the best books that were actually, like, solely a part of 2022. Yes, yeah. So, what do you got? So, I'm going to go ahead and kick it off with one that would probably make my top five if I really had to, to narrow this down. Uh, but that is Heavy Metal Drummer from Behemoth Comics. Uh, if you're a fan of psychedelic things and the 1980s classic They Live then this is the book for you. I mean, honestly, I really feel like I can't go in depth of the story because it'll just kind of give everything away. And it's more fun to just kind of open the page. Like the great thing about this book was like I'd open the page and I'd be like, okay, let me find something that's appropriate. I know. That's the other thing. This is always been hard to show. Um, But the artwork, I mean, you're here for the artwork you're going to get uh, a heavy metal drummer on a mission. We don't know what it is. There's some things behind the scenes. And you're just going to slowly peel the layers back and get a lot of really cool art in the meantime. Uh, I know that first issue is kind of hard to find now. Mm-hmm. Um, but the second one's actually the hardest one for us. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Mm-hmm. I, it was either the first or the second one that I remember a lot of people uh, had trouble getting their hands on. But... Yeah, I mean, if you're just looking for something very weird, very out there, something different, a lot of colors, and you're going to get like halfway through the issue and you're going to be like, wait, what the fuck? <laughs> What's going on? I have no clue. Um, and just kind of gets better and better with each issue. So, yes, Heavy Metal Drummer. Behemoth. I mean, I'm going to praise Behemoth until the end of time. Sumerian, if you've just joined oh, yes. comics. <laughs> Sumerian. Yeah. I'm going to support Sumerian forever. Yes. Um. From for my side, I'm gonna flip over to um. This is Dark Horse, and it's a Comicsology original that was put out. Uh, Dark Horse has the partnership with Comicsology to put all of their books out after um they've been released digitally. And this is Scott Snyder and uh Frank Avila working together. And Frank Avila is one of my all time favorite artists. Um. And Scott Snyder has always just, I think I have multiple Scott Snyder books in my my list for this year. Um, But this is the story of a man and his son who have been working to figure out uh, the history of this film. And the film has lost footage, kind of like found footage film that they uh, have put together. And it was all about a ghoul. And they end up tracking down the original director of the film. They kind of talk to him and they find out that the there might be more to the ghoul and there might be a whole secret society and all this like real stuff that was connected to it and basically the director tells them in the very first uh issue now that you've seen my film you're cursed too and what i love about it is we get to see the film too so then you leave yourself wondering even after the very first issue you're already like am am i cursed because I, I just watched the film, so am I cursed too? Um, and you get this awesome thing where they just go back and forth between the the ghoul movie and the found footage and the current story at hand, and everything just gets darker and darker, and this father and son are stuck right in the middle of it. You get Scott Snyder's incredible artwork, or storytelling, and Frank Avila's fantastical artwork that works so well with World War One kind of features, which is when the movie's supposed to take place. So phenomenally done. Three issues, a great way to just pop in and get a great story and move on. So Night of the Ghoul, definitely making the list. 
All right, up next for me from Image Comics, this is Bolero. Um, this to me kind of feels like how I felt when I read The Many Deaths of Layla Starr. You're going to get very beautiful art and just a really, really wonderful story. Um, this is essentially what if uh, you could jump into multiple lives and experience a bunch of different versions of yourself, but it is on a limited amount. And this is the journey of one girl as she goes through some of those experiences. Um, this kind of all kicks off after uh, she has a very serious breakup. You know, she's kind of lost trying to find herself and discover all the things that she wants to learn about love and loss and heartbreak and everything in between. It is a beautiful, beautiful story. Um, I was just like, this is one of those books that each issue... I knew I just I had to continue on. I had to know what was going to happen next. And I, the journey is just great. I mean, I I love this book so, so much. Um, another one of those that I think would maybe crack my top five of the year, just in terms of how wonderful it is start to finish. And it's the same artist who is currently doing Lovesick. So if you're one of the people grabbing Lovesick off the wall, this is a, right. a great like pre-book that you can jump into yeah. from them. Um, on my list, since you went image, I figured I'll follow up, uh, okay. to, with, from image comics, Daniel Warren Johnson's do a power bomb. Um, this is one of those where if you would have asked me, uh, on issue one, I would have said definitely going to end up making top list. And then it kind of went into a thing where I was like, Ooh, is it, is it going to make my top list? Um, and then I, I got to the end and the last issue of the book was so beautifully done that that alone would have put it on a top list for me um daniel warren johnson we always talk about him as an artist but i think we miss out on a lot by not talking about him as a storyteller much like scotty young i think their storytelling might just be just as strong if not stronger um and this is the story of a young girl who watches her mother uh die in the ring as a wrestler and she's given the opportunity to bring back her mother by a necromancer who says i really like wrestling i want to see uh, a tag team Mortal Kombat style battle, but instead of you living yourself, you're going to get to bring back one person. Uh, but it's tag team, so she has to figure out who she can partner with, and she goes and partners with the person who is responsible for her mother's death because she knows they feel guilty too, and they'll want to bring uh, her mom back. So the two of them go through this epic battle to try to bring her mom back from the dead and the growth and development of both of those characters and then both of them together as we go through this journey and basically learning that you are you can fight whatever you want to, but you can't fight death and loss because it comes for everybody and the thing you have to do is fight to live, not fight to uh, bring back the person who died. It's such a beautiful story. Daniel Warren Johnson, fantastic job. Seven issues wonderful every issue check it out i only got to issue two before i think i fell off into the dark abyss and um i i mean it's Stanley warren johnson he's never disappointed me in any moment or time with anything he's done but i do feel like it would have also been a topic yeah. for me if i finished it um up next is uh step by bloody step uh, another image title because Image, you know, they continue to do what they do, which is just put out really wonderful work. And this one actually came from Cy Spurrier, which I was kind of shocked by because I feel like he's always been one of those writers that kind of, you know, kind of just plays in the middle of the field. You know, nothing really spectacular, but never really disappointing either. Uh, and this is actually a, kind of a fantasy journey story. Uh, with a girl and her giant robot and the wonderful thing about this is the entire thing is wordless um, there is actually no word balloons in this which is wonderful because you get to see this beautiful like visual story unfold in front of you you get to see this world uh, that this little girl travels through you get to see civilization and all the good and wonderful things and also all the bad things that come along with it i mean this is just it's great i mean i'm i will always say that art is what i lean towards when it comes to comics and i mean this is exactly why it's this book right here i mean no words but you you you're like i know exactly what's going on mm -hmm. um and it's just it's so beautiful there <clears throat> sorry there's some really great two-page spreads in here 
I mean, this is art just at the top of its game. Um, so yeah, this is definitely one. Of the, and it's also completed. This is all, all you're going to get. So We use that in our workshops for our comic creation workshops. It's one of the books that we show students who are working on it because we try to explain, you know, comics are the combination of all of these things. And the fact that you can tell your story completely, you can build a narrative even without the words but you need to be able to express the words in some other way. Yeah. And so we showcase that for people who are not feeling confident in their writing, but they are feeling confident in their art, that there is a way to tell your narrative in that oh, capacity. Yeah, but you still have to tell the narrative. Mm -hmm. And so it's such yeah. a cool book for that. Um, for me, up next, uh, AWA Upshot's New Think. Um, this is, it's called Volume 1. I'm hoping we're going to get to see more, even if we, we may not. Um, they label all of them that way at, at AWA, just in case they want to get, uh, they do go with another volume. But this is uh, five incredibly wonderful issues of a book that was called kind of a, a comic book form of Black Mirror. And the issues, each one kind of addresses the idea of technology in our world and how we how we let it kind of control us. We talk about, there's one where it talks about how we let all the computers kind of take over the world. And if that would have been an alien invasion, we never would have even recognized what happened. Um, there's all these different, I'm going to try to find, oh yes, and you get different artists and things on different ones. So, um, but there was the last couple of them really, really, really just spoke to society in, um, in ways similar to what you would get from a Mark Russell book. Um, you know, we talk about Mark Russell and his great social commentary all the time, and there was uh, just some beautiful stories about how we as a society need to learn to listen to each other and learn to respect each other and learn to respect the world that we live on, and how if we could work together, we could actually do a better job of not only surviving but thriving as a human race. And um, they did it all in these really, really amazing stories with great conversations. And I love that the last story was a teacher talking to her students and all of the parents were just getting upset. Like, oh, you can't say that to my kids. You can't say that to my kids. And they're never going to understand. You can't put that kind of information in their heads. And the kids are sitting there having a conversation and getting it and having a wonderful time with the teacher. And it's the teacher finally looks at the parents and was like, who's really the problem? And I love that books are having those conversations and they're giving us that opportunity to talk about it. So New Think is definitely one. Each issue, it's anthology style. So if you don't want to sit down and read a whole book at one time, this is definitely a good one to pick up for that. All right. I have been kind of talking about, well, pretty much been talking about how great art has been this year. And I have three artists, all of which will be in this list, <laughs> who are probably my top three current favorite artists. One of those is Salvador Sanz, and uh, this year he returned with Mega. And all, all of the volumes did come out. I checked. They're all 2022 volumes. Really? So you're golden. Yes. Okay. Uh, this is uh, technically volume two. It is Rise of the Black Swan, and um, it is beautiful. I mean, I, I, I have never, I have no tattoos, and um, one of the first times I've ever looked at a book and been like, oh, I kind of want to get a tattoo of this. It is this. It's kaijus. I mean, it's kaijus, which already is something that's going to bring me into a book. Um, but there's also this uh, young girl who is kind of tied to the lore um, as she's kind of figuring out all that's going on. Her and her father, who's also kind of tied to this. Um, you're kind of trying to figure out, you know, the history of these creatures, where they came from. Um, yeah, oh my gosh. Look at that right there. This is just beautiful. It is truly, truly a beautiful book. Um, I mean, the detail on these pages is crazy. You're going to get your typical kaiju stuff. Um, some battles, and also the human side around it, which, you know, everyone loves when they watch their Godzilla. It's my favorite part. They love the human aspect of it, so of course we're going to get that as well. But uh, the first one, I believe, was only two issues. I think it was three issues, and so is this. Okay. Yeah. Um, two. Oh, they are two. Just kidding. Okay. Two um, issues each volume. Yeah, but, you know, it's oversized. You get to look at great art. Um, it's one of those books that I'll even, without reading the story, I'll just open it up. Especially the first, that first volume. Those, oh. 
And this is one of those moments where we were like, the stonebot imprint of Red 5 is an absolutely incredible thing. Whatever Red 5 does, we have to pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. And it opened up a whole new world of great comics over the last year. Um, and this was the big one for us that we were like, all right, I'm sold, whatever you do. Yeah, I remember flipping it open to like a page or two and just being like, oh my God. Yes. Um, all right. From me, I've got, um, from Vault Comics, I've got a uh, mindset. And this is actually still ongoing. I think the next issue might be the last issue. And uh, I'm going to freak out. But this is for people who are fans of the social network. This is a great one for you. This is all about a kid who has to complete a project for his university to graduate and ends up in the process discovering how mind control works and discovering how to run it through a social media app. So him and his friends decide the best thing they can do is convince people not to fall for social media. And they have this great, amazing plan of how they're going to free the world from social media and from all the mind control that's being done by influencing. Um, but the whole story takes place as a story. The main character is telling us from a police station. And we are waiting to see where all the murder and all the destruction and all of that comes into play. I just really want this to be made into a movie. This runs so perfectly well as a film. It's so deep. It's got a lot to it. It's been one of those kind of slow moving. And as you start to figure stuff out, a new layer is added onto it. And you're like, oh, maybe I don't know. And um, we're starting to see who's mind controlling who and what's actually going on as the story goes on. It's amazing. It's fantastic writing. You definitely should check it out. And um, this is one of those where Zach Kaplan kind of had a lot of books coming out at one time. And I was like, there's no way they're all going to be good, and this one floated to the top. They were all great, but this one definitely was the one that I was like, oh, now I'm going to pay attention to Zach Kaplan for sure because this book has been fantastic. And uh, Vault, give me that next issue already. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm going to go to Source Point Press. This is one of their oversized. Uh, this was only two issues as well. Uh, Postmasters. Uh, what a freaking, oh my god, I love this book so much. Uh, this is in a world where delivering mail is very crucial and very important, and this follows a few of your postmasters as they, uh, travel the rough terrain and battle all the vagrants, and kind of like a post-apocalyptic world, almost. And, uh, this is just, I mean, if you're a fan of anime... Uh, or manga, if you're a fan of like Kill Bill, um, samurais, battles, just really cool art, um, and, and a very interesting story, this is the way to go. Um, it's all in black and white, which um, I'm always on board for. Uh, I think doing really great art in black and white, it, it really proves that you're, you're talented, especially at shading. Uh, and shadows and everything like that and this book uh, it's just great it's super badass I get really excited I want it to be turned into an animated cartoon um, and I hope we see more uh, of this story as well um, but source point you know continuing like all these other publishers to just really release some some very interesting and new things that, that we haven't seen so absolutely um, I'm going to switch gears to Matt's pick, one of Matt's picks, I guess I should say, which is also one of mine. So I figure, um, I would talk about it, but it is Sarah Lone and it is from Sumerian Comics. And this is actually also the issue I believe that's new this week. Um, so, nice. uh, going to handle two birds with one stone right now, but this book has been fantastic. We call this our Scorsese film in comic form because you are definitely getting all of the intricacies of some slow moving Oscar winning drama. Uh, it's about a young girl who, um, she's probably like in her twenties or thirties. She feels like she's in her twenties, but she, um, her father is murdered, so she goes back to her home, and she ends up working in his fishery and trying to get all the, the things back on track. We've got people in the unions trying to take over. We've got mobsters coming after her. We've got the assassination of JFK going on, um, and the, the Cuban... The Cuban Missile Crisis, what? And, and, and sunken treasure. Yeah, anything and everything. And somehow it all connects. And it connects perfectly. Um, and it's so well done. And you see, you know everything about the character by the flick of their wrist. Like, this is that kind of well-written book. Where somebody says, 
two words on a page and you're like, I know how that man is going to respond in every situation from now on and I don't trust him. And you get all of that so well done. Uh, FBI, espionage, like intrigue. Uh, it is so good. If you were looking for a book that just literally has everything and feels like you're watching an Oscar movie, Sarah Lone is going to be your book. Um, like I said, this issue, issue also came out this week, so we're on issue three right now. It's fantastic. Sumerian, this is a completely different branch of your publishing company. You know, everything's kind of been like the wild and out there for the most part for Sumerian. Uh, this is taking it in a whole new level, like different direction, and I cannot wait to see if we get more stuff like this from Sumerian. Uh, fantastic. Pick up Sarah Lone. Check it out. Let's continue to just show how great Behemoth is now Sumerian is uh, with one of my favorites this is definitely a top five for me for sure it is Stargirl this is it gives me all my pinks and my blues and my aquamarines and my purples and all the colors that I love to see uh, when I read a comic book um, again that like manga video game if you like things like Steven Universe Sailor Moon I mean this encompasses all of that um, you are in a world where the cosmos are constantly being taken over by different gangs of girls called Star Girls, and they battle on different planets, good versus evil, and everything else. It is, it's magnificent. And this is one of those books where even at times, um, they would talk, like, from issue to issue, they would mention a character's name, and I'm like, wait, which which star girl is this again um but also they have uh reference pages in the back because they probably assumed uh that everyone that was going to read this book was going to be like wait who's this character again but all you need to know is that these really badass alien chicks are just doing awesome things in space <laughs> and battling each other with cool powers and uh yeah i i love this book so much i'm hoping that they continue doing this because it is definitely a fill, fill book, like, through and through. And if you want to make him really happy, Sumerian, you'll make action figures of those characters. Please, merchandise. Give me, like, a duvet set. You know, <laughs> everything. I want he went, he's all a of canopy it. canopy for Look, his canopy bed. Sumerian, there's one thing I could ask of you. Stargirl Crocs. <laughs> if you can deliver Stargirl Crocs, I will donate half of every paycheck I ever received for the rest of my life. To your company. I would watch it because they might, they might just do that. <laughs> <laughs> but please don't because my paychecks are kind of small. So, <laughs> you know. Uh, yes. Um, we <laughs> are... Uh, oh, Nick said shout out for being put on to Stargirl. A fantastic series and even more fantastic illustrations. See? It's so beautiful. Yeah. Um, I actually did not intend to go in order, but I think that what I have left is actually uh, my top six. So oh, okay. I actually... I'm very excited about that. Um, but up next for me from IDW Original Imprint, uh, we have Crashing. This is one where when I read issue one, I was like, oh, another kind of superhero y -S story because it is the story of a woman who works in an ER and she gets some superpowered people that come in and they basically tell her she can't work on them and she's like, I took an oath, I'm going to work on these people. And I thought, okay, we're going to do another, like, not superhero, superhero book. But then you find out that their reason why they're not allowed to work on superheroes is because there's a whole political thing where superhero lives, like, don't, like, they don't matter and they're trying to make sure that they're treated as separate separate citizens, like they're trying to segregate superheroes out. And the person who's in charge of that political campaign is her husband. And then you also find out that she is secretly working for the mob as their doctor. And the reason why is because she has a drug addiction problem. And she's been trying to, she's been in recovery for a long time. But of course, with everything going on, uh, issue one kind of starts out with her falling back into that addiction. And, um, this was issues one and two. I was like, wow, this is really well written. This is really great. And then issue three balanced her story of meeting her husband with her story of her addiction, with her story of her desire to be a good doctor and to help people. And it parallels all of those things together through the timeline. And I cried through the majority of that issue. It is so well done. Um, and that for me, I was like, that's it. This book goes on the pick of the year just for issue three. It's so good. And um, IDW Originals becomes a publisher that, uh, an imprint of this publisher that I have to pay attention to. I know 
IDW lost a lot of the uh, intellectual property titles that they've been working with over the last few uh, decades, really. And their big thing was we want to try to bring out some some new originals now that we have the room to grow with that. And guess what, IDW, IDW you are nailing it. Great job at selecting stories because Crashing is just one of two in my top six for the year. All right. Yeah, it's a good book. I was, like you, I was very impressed by, you know, Cause, yeah, because I was like, I feel like we have too many of these ER style stories set in a superhero universe, but this one did it really well. Yeah. It was like how Jeff Lemire <laughs> finds the, the pocket next yeah. to what the trend mm-hmm. is. This writer, um, who is Matthew Klein, also did the same thing, found that pocket and just explored that that depth in there. Okay. Uh, so in the world of comics each year... These public, these independent publishers are on the hunt for finding that it book, mm-hmm. you know, um, Walking Dead, Saga, something is killing the children. Uh, now, uh, what is uh, not Rogue Sun? Uh, what was oh, the, Radiant Black? Radiant Same Black. World, yeah. I mean, you are talking about creators going out there and trying to build these universes, have books mm-hmm. kind of branch off of them, uh, and this is one that I think Boom was trying for. Uh, and this is Grimm. Uh, it's written by Stephanie Phillips. Tampa. Art by Flaviano. Uh, this is that book that from issue one, I was like, okay, this has the potential based on the art and the story. Uh, this is the story of Jessica Harrow, who is a reaper. And right off the bat in the first issue, you get to see her um, bring someone into the afterlife and something goes wrong and the person that she was bringing into the afterlife steals her scythe um, and she falls into the real world and that kind of kicks off this whole journey of her trying to figure out who she is where'd she come from because it turns out she's the only reaper who has no idea how she died Um, all the other reapers know the exact moment they can kind of almost go back and relive it in a way she has no idea. It's just a blank slate there. And so this is the story of her kind of pretty much going out and being like, hey, I need to find the real Grim Reaper to answer all these questions. Um, there's a lot of really great side characters. There's like a 80s hair metal style rocker dude who's like the one guy I would love to have usher me into the afterlife. <laughs> I'm just telling his stories, uh, touring with like Guns N' Roses or something like that. Um, but yeah, this is, this is just one of those books. I I love the artwork. Um, the main character, Jessica Harrow is one of those where it's like, I want to champion this character. Um, I, I love the, the character designs. And of course I got Jenny Frizen covers. I was going to say, let's, let's be real here. It was the <laughs> Jenny Frizen covers that sold you initially. Uh, yes. Uh, Cause that first, I believe it was the first issue had the Jenny Frizen variant. And I remember seeing that cover and I thought, Whatever this book is, I'm here for it. Uh, and then you open up the pages, and it is everything you could want more. And again, I, I do hope that this is kind of Boom's next big book. Mm-hmm. So. Um, on my side, I have a book from Oni Press that I talk about in the picks of the week every week currently, uh, or every month currently, which is Pink Lemonade. And I love this book. When it first started, I was like, oh, this, really? yeah. This is a top book This is you? a top book for me. I cannot Dang. wait for you to get to the oh next few issues that you missed. What issue is it on? This, this is on issue, like, five now. Yeah, and honestly, wow. I actually, we, we're on issue four, and I can't let you read them all because I don't even have them anymore. Oh, I only so have nice. issue one and maybe one copy of issue four left. This book has been incredible for all ages, honestly. Um, first, you start out with ridiculous art like this, Um, which really gets your attention, but it's the story of a woman who has no idea where she came from. She rides around on her pink motorcycle and calls herself Pink Lemonade. And you think you're getting, like, this weird space mission, like, kind of crazy girl story. Uh, She ends up pairing up with not only a mother and a daughter, which she meets in issue one, but she ends up on a film set at one point, and she saves, like, the Dolph Lundgren kind of guy from a career that he doesn't want anymore. (laughs) Um, and then she ends up in this twisted tale of them trying to use her identity. And she's like, I don't even know what my identity is. And so this is a whole book, like coming of age story almost, but with an adult. And as adults, we all know that you get into your 
you know, your 20s and your 30s even, and you're, you know, you have that moment where you're like, I don't know if I know who I am in my 20s. You know, you're sitting there like, I don't really know who I am. I don't really know what I want to do. And you have those conversations with yourself and you just try to remain positive. And that positive voice in your head while you're trying to figure all that out is pink lemonade. She is the person in your head who's like, hey, it doesn't really matter. Just do the thing you want to do and be happy and don't hurt people. And if you do all of those things, no matter what you choose for your life, you're going to be amazing. And this has been that great, incredible story. And you do get that crazy art the whole time. Um, and you get the weird side quests and the fun, like, off-the-wall adventures. But the whole time, you're also getting that story. And it's been fantastic. I have kids all the way down to six years old that pick this book up and adults all the way into their 40s that love it. It is a book for all ages. And honestly, congratulations to Oni Press because they don't get – a lot of mention anymore in the last couple of weeks we've had a lot of oni press like picks of the week and this remains to be one of them every time and continuing on with that trend oni press this would be the other one <laughs> is blink uh this was a book that was pretty much a pick of the week every issue and um it is your horror haunted house kind of adventure and gives me the same vibes as uh, what's the cave movie where the girls go in the cave? The Descent. The Descent. Yeah. It's like that, where you're kind of crawling down this rabbit hole and you don't know where it's going and it's terrifying every step of the way. Uh, this follows a, a woman who, as a child, escaped from uh, a house, basically like the basement of a house. But if you decided to just continue building downwards and creating this giant world, and um, she finds out where this house is and decides that she is going to go in and figure out what happened because the last time she was the last time she saw her parents. And this book just goes down a very weird rabbit hole. And every time I get to the end of an issue, I'm immediately like, OK, I need to know because it's causing major anxiety. Um, but I just really also want to know because I feel like this is heading towards a really beautiful ending. Um, it's Christopher Sabella writing and of course, uh, another one of my favorite artists of the year, uh, Hayden Sherman, uh, just doing a wonderful job. I, I love this book. It is an easy top five pick for me. It is impressive that what Oni Press has been doing this year, um, this really, really, oh, just so freaking good all the time and you haven't read the end so yes i know I it's know. out i'm like i'm like you were like I oh i can't wait for this beautiful ending i'm like the ending is out don't spoil it in the I comments know. if you've read it because i cannot wait for phil i have been waiting for phil to be done i'm terrified with his work so that i could give him the last two <laughs> issues of blink so that i have to i can like yell things in his oh, face six issues it was five five six whatever it is i think there's two issues you haven't read we'll check I read the first four. Okay. So I think there's only one left. Okay. And it felt like we were getting pretty close to the end the while I was reading that one. ending is insanely good. So uh, I cannot wait. But since we, so I waited for this on purpose, since you went Hayden Sherman, I'm going to follow up with Hayden Sherman and Scott Snyder and IDW Originals with a Dark Spaces Wildfire. Now, if I needed to sell you this, I would just tell you that I have a photograph of Smokey the Bear reading this book about wildfires, and that should be reason enough that you want to read it, because it's good enough for Smokey the Bear. Um, but this book is incredible. It's, it's absolutely amazing. This is the story of some female prisoners who end up uh, assigned to the task of putting out wildfires in California, which I learned from some fi forest firefighters, um, forest firefighters that uh, that is actually a thing that happens. They do hire prisoners to go help fight the fires in California. Um, well, these particular women decide that the best thing that they can do is actually rob the house that's in the line of sight for the fire and for their path, which is filled with all kinds of money and art and all kinds of stuff that one of the girls um, was, that's actually why she's in prison, because her boss was the person who was hiding all the stuff in that house and she took the fall. So they come up with this incredible plan. You get your Ocean's Eleven style mystery where these women come up with it and you get all of that. But at the same time, you kind of have a backdraft thing where your narration is telling you about how a fire behaves and you have to watch for the different things going on in the fire the whole time. And 
I love that. I love the beauty of the narration in this book. Scott Snyder has always been a master of narration. That's it. He's a great storyteller, so he's always yeah. been great at that. But uh, Hayden's art just plays so well into showing you how flames move and how things like backstabbing and twists and turns go from both the fire and the humans. This book was incredible all the way through again this is idw originals has just killed it this year with their launch for all of these titles i mean they also had true cult on that line which was incredible and could have easily been in this top picks as well so if you did not read dark spaces um i can't sell you the copies because the hurricane ruined most of mine but find them uh or wait for the trade because it was a phenomenal story yeah um I feel like even though we are very much about the independent publishers, I feel like as a comic book show, we have to mention a big two book. We, you know. It, it, it's just necessary. And of course, I'm going to go with one of the best things that I think Marvel has been doing in the past few years, and that is the Grand Design line. Uh, they started with Ed Piscor on X-Men. Uh, Tom Scioli did... Um, Fantastic, Fantastic Four. Four. And now we have Jim Rugg, uh, the other half of the Cartoonist Kayfabe universe, uh, coming to do the history of the Incredible Hulk. The wonderful thing about these Grand Design series is that they are basically condensed retellings of all the big moments in the history of these characters. So if you ever wanted to get a feeling for what the past 60 years... Not quite, almost. The Hulk has been like, and you don't want to go back and read all those different issues. You can do it right here. There's some really great artwork in this. I mean, Jim Rugg kind of gives you that Silver Age feel, but nice little bit of his own twist to it. And, I mean, you're, you're going to see the Hulk and everything that the Hulk had to offer. Um, it's really great. They do homages to all the beautiful covers in the Hulk run, including this great McFarlane one. Um, it's 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 awesome, and I, I love that that Marvel is kind of taking this. Hey, let's give you a greatest hits, but kind of in this weird off the wall way. Um, I highly recommend picking it up, if, especially if you do want to know a little bit more about the Hulk. Um, and just get to enjoy all this Jim Rugg art. But uh, yeah, this was one of the few books this year where I was like, every cover. I just want all the covers. Give them all to me because, you know, Piscor did one, Scioli did one, and uh, of course the Jim Rugg as well, but mm, so good. So since Phil cheated and brought a big two book, cheated, I'm going to say, and brought a big two book, <laughs> I'm going to cheat and bring a book that actually started in December of 2021, and that is from a Blaze Comics, and it's Animal Castle. Um, I'm going to admit something to you right now. I don't like Animal Farm. Not a big fan of the Animal Farm book. I have a degree in English Lit and Criticism, and I actually don't never need to necessarily read Animal Farm ever again. And then they made, and then Animal Farm went into public domain, and they made Animal Castle, and I was like, never mind, I take it all back. Um, this is essentially a sequel to Animal Farm. It's post um, the revolution against the pigs, and now the steers and the dogs are in charge. And it follows a the last remaining cat, uh, adult cat, that is in the, in the group. Uh, her husband has died, and so now it's just her and her kittens. And she realizes that they need to have a rebellion. But what she learns is that they had a rebellion the last time with, and they, when they took out the pigs, but they did it through violence. And all that happens when you have a rebellion with violence is that the next most violent person ends up in charge. The people who had all of the, the weapons and the strength are the ones that end up in charge, and you end up back in the same spot you were in. So they have to learn to fight in a different way. They have to learn to fight intelligently um, and start this revolution in a completely different way. This is an incredible book. Uh, once again, I cried almost every single issue. Um, so good. It made me think I should go back and read Animal Farm and give it another chance because this was so much better than I ever remembered Animal Farm being. Um, and this was one of those books that uh, we've used. We've actually had so many teachers. This is a, a thing that we tell high school social studies and English teachers, give this to your students who 
who are like me who didn't get into Animal Farm. Um, this is a way to companion that story. And then also follow up with that same, a revolution can't always be about violence. Um, this is volume one. This was a French comic. It's already had four volumes in France, so there is more to come. I don't know when we're going to get it, if we're going to get it. I hope we get it, uh, but it the cliffhangers and stuff that it leaves you on every issue, but also at the end of this volume, so good. Definitely a top, a top five book for the last year, and I cannot wait. I think I shoved this in everybody's hand last year, so <laughs> read Animal Castle. Um, I also love this in a hardcover. I don't know yes. if it was uh, Animal Castle hardcover. All right. Art is the thing I love the most. And my top artist of the year, Marco Fontanelli, uh, who just wonderful, wonderful artwork. Uh, you get to see it here and also in another book he did in 2022 as well. Uh, but this is Pentagram of Horror. It is a five-issue anthology um, from Black Caravan, which is the Scout imprint, and each okay. what? No, oh, I just saw uh, the art again, and I was like, "Oh my god, I love that page!" And I mean, look, this is that's all you need. The art speaks for itself. The stories are crazy; they're all over the place. I mean, you get one that's tied to technology. You get your typical demon story. Um, <clears throat> you get kind of like your Western horror. I mean, he does it all. And each issue just kept getting better and better. And I was like, all of these issues are my favorite. Um, they were a pick of the week every time they came out. Because, I mean, this artwork is just crazy. It is so much fun to look at. <clears throat> and I want it blown up into an absolute edition. Yeah. I, I want posters of it on my wall. This series was fantastic. And he kind of hinted that he may do more. Um, so, you know, just get on to Instagram and tell Marco that you want more pentagram of horror because it is, the, we do. <laughs> it's the best art ever. I, I love this art and, um, I just want more from Marco Fontanelli. Like 2023, that's my thing. 2023, double the Marco Fontanelli. Also, Phil said he was voting for Marco, who is in Italy, for President of America, so... Yes, I mean, look, if everyone can throw their hat into the ring at this point, Marco is my pick. He um, would, I, I mean, we would just have a very creative world, and it would be wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> um, also, the other book that Phil mentioned from 2022 from Marco Fontanelli was King Jira. It was a one-shot about a kaiju monster who just wanted some pizza, and everybody thought he was trying to destroy the city. Um, as he makes his way to the pizza place. If you um, are in Florida, honestly, drive down to Scout in Fort Myers and look at all the incredible variants that they have uh, for that book because there are some amazing different variants for that and you need a copy of it. So just make that pilgrimage to Scout and, and check it out because there are some really great ones. And same with Pentagram of Horror. At this point, that's one of the only places you can get all of the issues. Um, I am happy to order them from Scout for you if you need them. Um, I have some issues left. I think I only have issue three left, honestly. But uh, <laughs> that's an anthology, so come grab issue three because um, it's fantastic. I have to mention two books that we don't have uh, books of to show you. I think that we do have them. I just have, I couldn't find them. Um, but the first one is another one of Matt's picks for the year, which was Lead City, um, also Red Five. Um, and it is the story of a family who is going through the Old West and the mom gets sick and they need medicine and money and things to do it. So the dad ends up um, joining into a competition to kill everybody. It's kind of like a shootout situation and the winner gets some money and you see he seems like an un, unassuming family man on his trip across the, the Old West and we kind of get to see him become this ultimate, like... Badass, I guess is the way to say it. And the art. And the art. The book. The, the art <laughs> I know. Is so awesome. The art is one of the incredible things uh, that I wish I had to show you because it was such a good book for that. Um, and we do, I think we have a couple of the issues floating around, but um, it's it's so good. And then the other one is from Boom Studios, um, Alice Ever After, which is Dan Panosian. And it's the story of Alice who from Alice in Wonderland. 
And uh, she keeps telling everybody about Wonderland, and her family assumes that she is a drug addict, which, spoiler alert, she is. And uh, they end up putting her in a mental asylum in the 1800s, which means she is destined for a lobotomy, essentially. And uh, she kind of is trying to fight her way out of it, and all of the characters in the asylum that are bad guys are all of the villains from the Alice in Wonderland story, and all of the characters that are good guys are characters who helped Alice along her way. Uh, through Wonderland and it is such an incredibly amazing book if you are an Alice in Wonderland fan and you didn't read Alice Ever After um, the trade paperback comes out next month maybe in March um, and I'm super excited I know Matt and I have talked about possibly having an Alice Ever After a tea book club where you can come in and like read and we'll read an issue of Alice Ever After and then we'll have some tea and we'll talk about it because we just need to have some mad tea parties while we talk about this incredible book. Um, it's fantastic. It's another one where I wish I could show you the art right now because the art was killer. Um, so of course the two books that I want to show you the art on most I don't have. So use your imaginations and know that Lead City and Alice Ever After are books that you definitely need to read when those trade paperbacks come out later this year. Um, speaking of trade paperbacks and books you definitely need to read from Source Point Press, we have Nook. Um, this is a three-part story. All of it's right here. It's a little bit, as you can see, a little bit more magazine size. And um, I posted a picture of this earlier, and somebody literally commented trigger, and I was like, because this book will make you cry. <laughs> I know. And it's it's 100% true. Um, this is the story of a family who is fleeing from uh, World War II Germany, and they go to a remote place in France, and it's a mother, a daughter, and a, a mother, a father, and a daughter. And in the middle of the night, this daughter is visited by a cat. And she follows the cat down the stairs, and she goes into this little nook, and she sees, I don't even want to show you, I was going to show you, but now I'm like, no, don't do it. Um, she sees something there that uh, terrifies her. Well, as the story goes on, of course, as we know, in World War II, you couldn't really escape the uh, German oppression. And so this uh family has to face down against some of those things and uh, we find out the history of the house and of some tragic events that have happened there that are making these ghostly occasions happen and we see some crazy crazy things happen what for this little girl um, it is both sad and terrifying the entire time and I had read issue one and then issue two came when we were moving, so I never got to read it. So I read all three issues today and was literally like, throw everything else off my list. This is it. It's going on there. Oh my God, I can't believe I waited this long to actually catch up on those last two issues. And then I uh, cried a little bit from how beautiful it was. So if you need a, a kind of almost Coraline-esque moment with like this secret like world that this little girl goes to, but even scarier. Um, this is going to be a great one for that. This is, it's, it's so good. Um, and it's only three issues, but it's thick and it's that same black and white art, which works perfectly for how terrifying some of the scenes are. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, I say this for last because I knew I was going to talk more than you, but also I know you have something to say about this, I'm sure too, from Dark Horse Comics. Um, I literally, when issue one of this book came out, said, this is my pick of the year. So here we go, Survival Street. Um, I love this book so stupidly much. Uh, this is the story of where we're heading, <laughs> but we don't have Muppets to save us. Um, this is a uh, society is crumbling. We've allowed corporations to count as people. So they're able to vote in politics. They're also able to hold political positions. And because capitalism rules the world, they decide to shut down uh, Sesame Street, essentially, which is called Salutation Street in this book because we don't want to be sued. And um, the felt Americans, as they call themselves, the living Muppets, um, decide that it's their responsibility to take back the world and to remind people that there is goodness in the world and sometimes you have to fight for it much. Uh, so they take their message to the streets, if you would. Uh, this book is fantastic. It's got all of the great moments of you know of, of again like kind of like a mark russell book where it's almost satire but it's also filled with these incredibly great messages um but you get if you are a muppet fan or a sesame street fan like there's a character named milo who only talks about himself in third person and is always like milo says he's not gonna help you if you don't do this and milo says this um you get all of your great Muppet moments, but you also get just this incredible story about how we need to make a change before it's too late. 
which is, you know, the message of Sesame Street at the end of the day. Be kind to others, make the world a better place, and um, do do it so Super Grover doesn't have to come and try to save the world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I agree with everything, so... <laughs> Fantastic book. <Wonderful> and uh, book. <laughs> when the hardcover comes out and I only get one, just know that you might have to fight Phil for it. Well, order two. Give him a chance. <laughs> give everybody a chance for it. Yeah, give, give him a chance. Because everyone should read that book. Absolutely. Most definitely. And I do still have all four <laughs> issues, so if you want to read it right now and not wait for whoever knows how long it'll take before a volume, a, a trade paperback or a hardcover comes out of it, um, come grab all four issues and then come back and talk to me about how much you loved all four issues because it's, it's so good. Also, uh... 2023 let's get more prestige format i know people hate them because they don't fit in your long box and there's not a bag and board for it i don't care more prestige format but but they sit sideways in your long box or your short boxes which is my thing i was gonna say in 2023 buy prestige formats if you have been yeah. one of the people who's been like hey I don't want to get this book because it's oversized and it's weird and I don't buy magazine bags and boards and I'm not going to buy one just for one book. Take the risk because it's like Matt always says, it's like watching a movie in IMAX. Yeah. It makes, it's made to show off how incredible the art is. You know, Postmasters, Mega, Nook, what we just talked about, a, a vicious circle. I mean, everything, that uh, DC's best work is in their prestige. I mean, Catwoman, Lonely City. We're gonna uh, my favorite uh, yeah, art piece of the year. Uh, Nicholas got on Wonder Woman Historia. If you want to know why you need to read a prestige format book and take the chance, oh my gosh, where is? I mean, just this one alone. Take the chance on prestige format because you can get an IMAX version of of comic books and it's worth it. So if you're one of those people who shies away from prestige format books pick one up i challenge you to pick up one this year and stick with that title and just see how much you can fall in love with a prestige format like don't sit here and tell me that you, it would have been any better to have wonder woman dead earth by daniel warren johnson and anything smaller than what it was that's crazy i i want more prestige especially if you're, because I mean, you know, that was not even the best issue of you know, no. the story. No, Phil Jimenez is beautiful art on number oh, one that I will never Lord. be able to show you because I have none in stock. Good Lord. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. I, I feel like let's get some of these artists who have proven themselves to be very talented human beings. And let's just be like, hey, take your art and blow it up. Let's make it as big as we can. I mean, there was a point in time when absolutes were a legit thing yeah i mean like, treasury editions have been a, have been a thing i actually to speak of wonder woman history of issue one i actually had a girl who was majoring in fine art at the university of texas come in and say that they had encouraged them to go out and buy issue one wow. of wonder woman historia because it was such a great example of fine art in the modern time and how we use that now in a different medium yeah. so um if you can find wonder woman historia volume one you should buy it and just yeah. and that can be your 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 entry into prestige format. Yes. Um, all right, so out with the old, in with the new. Except for all those titles that are still ongoing that I told you I needed publishers. Don't forget them. Don't drop them. I need them still in my life. Um, we've got the books from last week. It was a small week, but it was a good week. Yeah, you, you gave us you gave us some great books with your small week. I appreciate that. It's always a small week that right after the the holiday season. So um, we're going to kick it off with a book that I loved issue one of. I was very excited for issue two. It's from Red 5 Comics, and it is issue two of Atonement Bell. Yes. Uh, this was one of those where I was pleasantly surprised with issue one. And, um, of course, it was because of a character design, of a specific character that they throw right there in, like, a full-page spread right off the bat. I'm like, oh, my God, whoever this is, I want more. Um, and in that first issue, we kind of get the story of a young boy and his mom who go to spend time, uh, with the mom's sister. Mm -hmm. Uh, she's very religious and, um, invites them along to the church and the boy goes down in the basement of the church and, um, you know, deals with some demonic stuff and we're not really a hundred percent sure what it is. Well, Here's issue two, 
And it tells you everything you need to it know. It tells you everything. And everything you need if to you know. think, if you read issue one and you were like, wow, that started really intense, you have not seen an opening yet. Because yeah. the opening of issue two, I was like, where is this going? And then I was like, oh my God, we're going there. Yeah. Okay, we are we are doing that thing. And uh, so that was a super, super shock to me that we were moving in that direction. And yeah. issue two has shown that this series is not going to let up at all as it goes on and things are just going to get worse and worse and i do like that we got um a little bit of backstory yes and a little bit more knowledge on who's involved with what we're doing but good lord wherever we go with this red five has again not disappointed me i mean they wrote a book about carrier pigeons defending new york city (laughs) as militant like animals and i was a hundred percent hooked and so it's not surprising that anything they put out i'm going to be like I need whatever happens next. Yeah, I am very excited for what's to come with this book. Um, towards the end of it, we are getting to know that character that I wanted to see more of. And um, the introduction has only begun. And um, I'm hoping in the next issue or two, it's all going to hit the fan. Oh. It's going to go crazy. And I'm here for every bit of it. Um, so yeah, pick this up. Um, you're not going to be disappointed at all. Yeah. Um, the next two books we're going to talk about are actually great for all ages. And uh, the first one is from a Blaze Comics, which is issue two of Family Time. And I actually had a family in this week that the young girl picked it up because her grandma was like, oh, we're from Ireland. This will be fun. And if you don't know, this is the story of a family. The parents are kind of all in their business. They kind of don't really pay attention to their kids. And so they decide we have to go on a family vacation to, like, have a good summer together. And so they go to Ireland. And um, the dad tries really hard in his own. He is the worst own ter- I I feel like I've seen oh this actor like I gosh. like you could see almost a Stanley Tucci like playing it like really like ridiculously um but this is the family goes to Ireland they're staying at this hotel and while they're out migrating around they end up going back in time and none of them have any clue yeah except for maybe the son yeah because they well You know, they're kind of under the impression that it's, like, this all-inclusive, like, crazy tour that they're getting added on to. Like, they go to a pub and they're like, oh, this is one of those all-immersive adventures I've been hearing about. And uh, it's great, too, because, like, they they meet this lord, uh, Syrian or Syrian. He's got kind of one of those weird older old-school names. But he's like, here, I'm going to take you to my dungeon. And they're like, oh, yeah, let's go. Oh, kids, we're <laughs> locked up, I guess. Uh, it, it, it's even great, too, because, like, the dad's like, oh, look at these comically widespread bars that a child can fit through. <laughs> and they're just, like, so delusional the whole time. <laughs> just, it's, it's fantastic uh, how, like, cheesy the parents are because it works so well for this, you know, having a chance for the kids to be the heroes yeah. in this story. But the son, who is actually spending the time figuring it out, has also been the one who wanted, wants to believe in magic his whole life. And so he's constantly pointing out what he thinks is a magical experience. And, of course, now he's the boy who cries wolf as they're on this adventure. And so I can't wait to see why, because we know that their hotel, like the guy who took them to their hotel and who kind of oversees the hotel seems to be involved in some capacity of like sending them back in time, but we don't know why yet. And so I can't wait to find out why they're there. Uh, But this has been, again, it's great for all ages. Uh, If you want something to read with a kid, this is, or have the kid read to you, this is going to be a good one for that. But as an adult, I, it's just, it's an endearing story for sure. Also, if you're a kid who has a parent, one of those parents that you're just like, Dad, when he says something stupid. Like, this dad tries so hard to be hip and cool, and it's so bad. And I I feel, I I just feel for his kids. You, like, cringe with the kids. (laughs) Oh, you're just like, come on. (laughs) Come on. Uh, um, From Image Comics, we have issue four of Kaya. Yes, this is... um, Wes Craig just doing all the wonderful things that Wes Craig does. Um, So this is the story uh, of Kaya, who is a young girl who, after her uh, village is destroyed, 
uh, her and her brother go on an adventure as the remaining two humans uh, in their tribe. And uh, in these issues so far to this point, they are teaming up with some lizard riders, uh, one of which has a bit of a past with Kaya, maybe a little uh, romantic connection in there. Um, and in the previous issue, they go on a hunt to kill a two-headed spider monster um, that has been terrorizing um, this village and killing the cattle from the farmers. And so they end up going and trying to hunt those down. And this issue is the aftermath of that. We have kind of reached the end of like their first adventure. Um, kind of like when you go, when you're playing D&D, there's like the questing portion and then there's the actual like, you're going into in a dungeon and fighting things. This is kind of like the end of that. Um, and they are heading towards uh, Goro Bay or Goro City, or Goro Bay, um, which is where the next portion of the story is going to take place. This is kind of the like, hey, this happened. Also, maybe something with the little brother happened as well. Mm -hmm. It's kind of exciting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, this is one of those that I feel like we we have that kind of three issue rule. And by issue three, I was like, yeah, totally on board for this. And then this one, I'm just like, now I can't wait to see what comes next. Because we're opening this world. We know some things are probably going to go crazy here in a bit. But this is also one of those, because like some stories I feel like, I'm like, all right, let's get to that point. Let's get to it. I want to see it happen. But here I'm just like, let's take our time. You know, let's kind of work through it. Like when I read Twig or when I read Bone for the first time. I was like, I want to live in this world forever. Uh, Kaya is one of those. That's the book. Sorry, we were talking earlier today, and I was like, I feel like I'm missing a really obvious book that I loved in 2022. It was Twig. Oh. That was the book that oh. I loved in 2022 and, and I forgot about. The other one that we kind of mentioned that was on the list was uh, 8 Billion Genies. Yeah, well. 8 Billion Genies. Yeah. Those were two books that were yeah. definitely at the top, but Twig is the book that I was like, there's a book that's so obvious. And I even said, Scotty Young, I love more as a, a writer than yeah. an artist in that conversation. It was Twig. Yeah. Read Twig. It's fantastic. And also read 8 Billion Genies because I think it's one of Charles Soule's best books. Yeah. I would agree as well. Yeah. Yes. Also, read Kaya because it's Wes Craig. If you and your young ones read Jonna together, Kaya is your next yes. step. It's yes. your step 100%, after Jonna. 100%. 100%. Um, and so, yeah, we also already mentioned this. I'm just going to throw this out there. But uh, issue three of Sarah Lone came out this. It actually came out two weeks ago. But for some reason, mine didn't get here until this week. So issue three of Sarah Lone came out. I already kind of told you what it's about. So I'm not going to dive into it again. Because um, I actually showed you issue three earlier. Um, but read Sarah Loan. <laughs> um, up next from Image Comics, we have issue two of Radiant Pink. We what talked the... about the Radiant Black universe getting bigger. Is that a mistake? No, it's it's weird. Um, <laughs> we talked about the Radiant Black world getting even bigger. Um, this is the next installment of that. We get a lot of miniseries that connect to Radiant Black. I think Rogue Sun is the only one that is an ongoing um, while all the other ones have been tiny little four-parters, uh, five-parters. This is Radiant Pink, who we met in Supermassive, which is the one shot that connects the, the whole massive verse, which has now been expanded to include Dead Lucky. And for those of you who have been Kyle Higgins followers for a long time, he has gone back and retconned Cal into the massive verse so if you are a kyle higgins fan and you know his one of his very early indie works he has now found a way to retcon that into the massive verse so you might have to find that soon that said radiant pink is all about uh the pink radiant universe member uh, i almost want to say power ranger because that's essentially what a lot of the time they are um and she is a social media influencer in real life and so what she's been trying to do is ha uh, show off the superhero powers without giving away her secret identity so she's been having to uh showcase her powers in two different places like her power in one place but also act like she's covering it it's been a whole big mess kind of reminds me of sideways um from from the uh dc universe Anyway, she, in the last issue, ended up getting sucked through a portal, which is one of her big powers, that she can make portals. Ends up sucked into a portal, not where she wants to go. And in this issue, she cannot get back to where she's supposed to, to our world and our time. And she has an EMT with her that she saved in the last, the end of issue one. 
and uh, they are kind of stuck together. And one of the things I love about it is they keep she keeps yelling at the girl that she saved, and the girl's like, I understand that you're not mad at me. Like, you're upset about the fact that your powers aren't working in the way you want to, and you're supposed to be a superhero, but, like, stop yelling at me. Um, so it's super cute because I already have this couple-style dynamic, and I'm really hoping... Um, like I already, I already shipped them as a couple, and I hope that's where we go in this in this story because it would be really incredible. Uh, but Radiant Pink, been super great. Um, it has yes, issue one starts with social media, but issue two has no social media in it. So uh, don't feel like you're gonna just get that constant like oh hey guy like sideways where it was constantly yeah. like on his phone trying to like report his stuff. This one doesn't actually have any of that in it, so we nice. may be moving away from that. Um, up next from Boom Studios, we have issue three of The Approach. Uh, I don't think you've read any of this. I have not. No, I didn't I think not. so. Um, well, I will say the best thing that The Approach is doing, hands down, is that every one in ten variant is done by Megan Hutchison. So, nice. I, and they're all movie homage. So, the one for this was a Snakes on the Plane homage, but with, like, the creature from The Approach. So, uh, <laughs> shout out to Megan Hutchison, because I love her. Um, she's my witch sister, and she's the best. But, this is the story of a giant snowstorm that shuts down an airport. And our local firefighter, who always has to handle all that stuff, has set up his camp at the airport. And uh, he's got his air traffic controller to make sure there's no planes coming in, everything like that. And suddenly a plane shows up from nowhere, not on any radars, not on anything. You know how it goes. And um, it crash lands and they saved the, the pilot and the passenger. Like they bring them in. They didn't save them. They, they are assumed dead. And they bring them in. And uh, suddenly now we have the monster toy. We don't know what's going on. We just know it's bad. Issue three kind of, give, kind of gives us a little bit at the end of this, like, backstory that we weren't prepared for. Um, it's just, it's classic horror, like, jump scare, like, oh, my God, there's a monster there kind of thing. Um, if But in a snowstorm at an airport. So uh, if you want to be scared of winter and airports, read The Approach. I like it. Yeah. You would because the art is really cool, the way they, like, showcase the creature that yeah, comes out. Yeah, I like the art style. Yeah. And um, I think issue two's one in ten from Meg was the terminal, but the like t like movie poster. But the Tom Hanks like has like the creature like coming out of him. It's super cool. Um, I'm trying to remember the poster. It's just like Tom Hanks standing there with his suitcase or whatever. It's oh, like a okay. white poster. Okay. Um, up next from Band of Bards, new publisher. Who again? I still need to look up, but this came out like back to back since I said that last because uh, they're slogan is doing good comics doing good which means we need to be buddies uh but we have issue two of prospects did yes, you catch up i, I gave did you both. yes okay. um this is one of those where i feel like you know there's always that people who want to create movies will turn it into a comic book because the format is very similar i feel like someone who wants to do a netflix animated show mm-hmm created this comic instead uh this is basically um in a world where uh two scientists both were trying <laughs> to figure out how to create immortality for this town and they had differing uh ideas and one figured out immortality could be done through turning people into zombies and the other one realized that immortality can be achieved by turning people into cyborgs uh, so every year um, they pick a select few from different families to decide which side they're going to um, be transformed into. And then they get transformed into it uh, and they pretty much have like turf wars yeah. between the two. And this kind of follows two different characters, one who uh, has been chosen to decide which one he wants to be. Uh, obviously, he just doesn't really care. Uh, and the other one is kind of your lovable loser. Um, your kind of dorky, you know, 20-something, not really sure where he's going in life. Um, and it's kind of their adventures into this. It's it's a really fun book. When issue one opened with the one guy standing there trying to decide between chocolate milk and vodka, I was like, man, I wish Phil was here. Yeah. Um, this is a Phil book. Like, and, and then he goes home and he's, like, upset about, like, be, being in his grandma's, like, basement. I actually, and we talked about this with issue one, I almost, because it's, which, it has this great transition from 
showing both of them having this trouble with decisions. Like you see the one character having the trouble between the chocolate milk and the vodka, and then you have the other one trying to choose between the two girls. And so obviously as the whole point now that we know after issue two is that they have to choose between being cyborg or being zombie is that these people are both very, very bad with choices and also very, very much hate the society that they're in. Yeah. And um, I love that we had the transition. I almost thought that one of them was the younger version of the other uh, after I read oh, issue wow. one because yeah. I was like, oh man, these two kids are so alike that they could almost be like the same, the same person, person. Yeah. and and yet they have completely different takes on it so i can't wait to see what happens in issue three because i feel like both of these characters are going to hit this climax where a their stories might intersect uh a little bit more and b where we're going to have to see how their indecisiveness comes into play yeah and um this has been surprising like i was surprised after issue one um, it, it definitely does have an animated story feel. I feel like they, to your point, it almost feels like they tried to write an episode for something like Rick and Morty. Yeah. And uh, they they were like, oh, you know what? Like, let's do this on our own instead. Yeah. Um, kind of has a little bit of that feel. I actually said this feels very Kyle Starks after the first issue. Because um, he's doing the alpha betas for okay. what whatnot right now. And this could be the people who didn't make it into the Alpha Betas program. Um, so I definitely see some Kyle Starks influence in a lot of that, which goes back to the Rick and Morty as well, since Kyle Starks is this main, like, Rick and Morty comic writer. Yeah. Um, yeah, issue two, Prospects. Band of Bards, right? Yeah. Yes, Band of Bards Publishing. Uh, it, contact me. I want to know what comics doing good means, because we are a 501c3 comic organization, and our whole thing is comics can do good. So uh, if you're watching this, Band of Bards, which I hope you are, um, I would love to know what your doing good is and how our doing goods can comics together. Uh, let's talk. So uh, Nick said that the approach sounds like the mist, and it totally reads like it too, Nick. So I, I feel like that might be part of why Meg does the movie variants for it, but... I always get the mist and the fog mixed up. It's the same thing. It's fine. One is John Carpenter and one is the guy from Smallville. No, I think he was just in the modern day of the fog, actually. Oh, okay. Mm. But is the is the fog the one that has the fake action figure that I love? Oh my god, I love it. It's the greatest thing ever. I don't know if you've seen that. It's a fake reaction uh, action figure and it's the fog. So it's just like a piece of cotton batting. In the, in the thing. That's genius. I, I want it. I would buy it. I'm the idiot who would buy that. So, you know, make hey, it. There was a point in time where I think it was McFarlane who did the Rocky line and they actually released the meat, the slab of meat that he trains on. That's never seen Rocky. What? Yeah. I know. Um, I like boxing. He doesn't, right. That's a whole other conversation for another day. Speaking of IDW originals, uh, we have issue four of Earth Divers, Phil Columbus. Um, if you have not read this story yet, this is the story of some people in our future who, uh, America is destroyed and they're like, oh no, we need to go back in time and fix it. And they pinpoint the fall of America as the moment when Christopher Columbus allegedly discovered it. And so, um, this is actually, it's a group of, of Native American people who decide they're going to go back and stop Christopher Columbus from discovering America. We're going to keep putting that in quotes. Um, Look, I think my if, history books in school told me that he discovered... Something. The new country. Yeah, so we're going to keep putting it in quotes. And I think issue one actually came out on Columbus Day, which made it even better uh, to me. But this is the story of the person that they sent back in time who is a linguist. And they figure he's the best one because no matter where he ends up, he can, he can kind of migrate his way through the whole situation because of the fact that he can speak any language, specifically the language that Columbus and their his shipmates spoke on the thing. Well, he's decided, because he knows all of history, that he's going to use the history as a way to seem like a prophet on the ship. And that has landed him in the brig and Columbus not trusting him. So his whole plan is kind of backfiring. And now he is seeing a goat talk to him kind of like a Baphomet situation and uh he's got to get out of it we have no idea what's going on this is it's not going the way it was planned at all however at the same time we see his wife and some friends in the future and they're trying to figure out if it worked or not and things keep changing and happening there and they're having to deal with it it's fantastic if you're gonna have a time traveling story 
This is definitely a great one. I know we always talk about how, like, even, like, Doctor Who, everybody is always like, let's go back in time and kill Hitler. I love that we chose a different person to focus on for once in that kind of situation. And this has been a, a great story. And I love uh, the tagline, new worlds aren't discovered, they're built. Great tagline for this book. Great tagline in general. Uh, read Earth Divers and uh, remember to celebrate Native American Heritage uh, and Indigenous People Day. Um and that's the more important holiday uh from aftershock comics this is so there's a lot going on with aftershock we're not going to talk about it um but they did finally push out a couple of the books uh endings so we're not going to talk about what's going on with aftershock right now per se but we are going to talk about these creators who made some books and uh how you should support creators no matter where they go um and the first one is astronaut down this is issue five and this is a story of a situation where some astronauts are sent actually through kind of kind of like in an interstellar kind of way where they're sent through time more than space. Uh, but whoa, it's whoa. like spoilers for interstellar. <laughs> is that really the point of interstellar? I was sick when I watched it. I'm not really sure if I, I remember what it. happened. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but these astronauts go through space and time, and the whole thing is that, like, our Earth is being destroyed, and so they think the way to save it is to go to, like, another version of our Earth, and they need to, like, save that one, and they're going to send this code through space, and it's supposed to save things. Um, over the last five issues, we've actually seen the one person who survived that in all of these different realities, and he's finally landed in reality where he's back with his wife, and it's been this beautiful, amazing thing, and then he finds out that he can still transmit the code and save everybody on his Earth, and possibly, like, their Earth at the same time, and he's like, you know what, that's my whole point in existing, like, I know this is, a, this is the beautiful and it's great for us to be together but if i die trying to do this like that's the point and uh issue five was a tearjerker moment this is your climax of your movie this has been one of those comics that reads like a film the whole time um and i would 100 percent like james patrick if you find somebody who wants to turn this into a movie i will watch it it will be great um this is definitely a great read pick up all five issues um and and check it out because it's been wonderful um, and uh, one of our favorite writers at Bat City, Paul Tobin, issue four of The Calculated Man came out. If you did not read this series, this is uh, just kind of Paul Tobin flexing on storytelling, honestly. Uh, it is the story of a guy who is the accountant for the mob. And he talks about how, A, he cannot tell a lie, and B, he can see the odds in everything. And it's just kind of where he is mentally. And we open the story in issue one with him talking to the FBI agent who is supposed to be protecting him because he's turned state's evidence on the mob. And now that guy is retiring. So his partner is taking over. So the whole thing is kind of like him telling, like starts with him telling the, the new person all about him. We also see him for the first time in like his life dating a woman. And he keeps pretending to be, uh, a guy who's assassinating a bunch of people. Uh, spoiler alert, he's assassinating a bunch of people. He's going after everybody in all of the mob families that has ever crossed him. And he's doing it all mathematically so that nobody can catch him. And we finally figure out the whole thing in this one. And dang it, Paul Tobin, you are incredible as a writer. And good for you. Good, good for you. And um, I can't wait to see where Paul Tobin lands next and what kind of incredible stories we get wherever Paul Tobin ends up going. All right. Um, let's see. Phil, where do you where do you want me to go? Oh, go this one. This one. You said you really liked the art. So I want to hear what you actually thought of the story, too. Oh, yes. <laughs> this is Hammerfall. From Opus Comics, uh, they are the publisher that pretty much has tied all of their series to, oh my god, another book I could have put in my top, the Evanescence comic. Oh, you really love that book. Dude, guys, we could have done a top 100 of 2022 and we would have been here all night. <laughs> yes, so this is um, named after the uh, power metal band from the 90s called Hammerfall. You figured it out! Yes, um... <laughs> They are pretty much like a Judas Priest, Iron Maiden kind of right. ripoff. Not, I don't want to say ripoff, but you know they're from Sweden. 
And, um, you know, they came about in the 90s and said, hey, we're going to do all the things that Maiden did, um, but not as cool as Maiden. Um, and did you listen to them? Did you- I did. Okay. I actually today listened to their entire discography while I was at work. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's power metal. Uh, we, we all love power metal. And um, so this here is um, I, a character that is featured on pretty much all of their album covers and it is a guy who <laughs> kind of has Mjolnir yeah and this really badass armor and is gonna go around and rid the world of evil uh it's much like the lyrics to their songs very cheesy like I feel like the writer of this book went in and found all the big 10 cent words that like are you know where it's just like i need to google some of these words but also why is there so many it's very poetic but in sort of a cheesy way and you loved every second of it i did because (laughs) i listen to the albums and then i read this book and i'm like it all fits perfectly together uh but the art's really cool uh you do get the your typical like hey here's my backstory uh, from the start to finish, and I was betrayed because I'm good, and now I am the bringer of all goodness yes. and justice. Two things. I don't listen to metal music at all, and I love every Opus comic in a stupid amount of love. Um, I don't know what it is. I Apparently, I need to like metal music more than I do because I am obsessed with these Opus comics that come out, and I, I, I just love them. Uh, and part two of my interruption is that Nick says, oh, did you say an Evanescence comic? Excuse me. We did. I will pull it for you. I believe it's still ongoing. We've only had two or three issues. So I think it's over. Oh, was it only three? It was... I thought it was 25. Is it? I don't know. I'll look. I'll look. I'll investigate. That's my job. Um, <laughs> but yes, uh, if you do like metal, um, which I, I am a fan of metal music, uh, and you kind of like those like fantastical concept albums, and you want to see what it's like in the visual format, here it is, Hammerfall. Yeah. Uh, pick it up. It's uh, <laughs> it's quite entertaining. Ironically, I will also say that's my last copy. <laughs> That book really? sold like crazy this week. So Three if people. you are interested in Hammer, well, because of the art, everybody opened it and was like, wow, this art's super cool. Okay, so, let's be honest. If, if, There's a lot of Hammer Fall fans in Florida. <laughs> I mean, maybe. No, everybody was like, I don't know who this is, but look at this art. And I was like, that's so true. Which is funny because, which, which I, I was with like that with the next book. Um, but uh, Ram says he's heard of Hammerfall and is a fan of the power metal, metal genre. Uh, Ram, if you who need that it? book, let me know. Because, like I said, last copy. Uh, I saw this cover from Opus Comics and thought this was going to be um, the one that everybody would want just because this cover yeah. was so cool. Uh, this is the Phantom Tomorrow issue one as well. Um, but then you were like, oh, it's related to a band that's not my favorite. And I was like, I don't know who this is because I don't know any of these bands. So, so it's based off of a band called Black Veil Brides, um, which it's a little more personal for me. There's, There's... Bands in this world that you are almost, like, programmed to hate. All right. Um, you know, like Nickelback. I love Nickelback. I'm going to say it. I, here's the thing. It. Here's the thing. All of the, I actually found a, a, an article the other day because I follow a few um, music magazines and stuff and blogs on Facebook. And one of them was like, here's 20 bands that you're supposed to hate. And it, I went through the list and I was like, I, I love them. Almost right. All of you these said the biscuit and Nickelback, and so far I'm like, yeah, um, I could listen to either. And um, Black Veil Brides was one of those bands that came out kind of at the tail end of my emo career, and they played with a lot of like hardcore bands that I loved who were trying to make that mainstream jump. And they they all look like they just walked out of Hot Topic together, <laughs> but they also very much like Hammerfall, kind of do this like old school power metal sound um they kind of sound like if you're familiar with the band him his infernal majesty it was bam margera's favorite band also at one point in time my favorite band 
Uh, Is kinda... it your favorite? Was it your favorite band because it was Bam? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah, sounds yeah. right. Um, yeah. And so he, well, he introduced me mm -hmm. to the band. Him, uh, kind of like a cheap rip off of that. But I actually also at work today listen to the album that this is based off of and uh you know it, it, it's uh it's an album it is an album more importantly than any of that not to discredit your feelings but this is written by the writer of barbaric so true, true. if you were like hey i don't know which one to pick up this one is written by the writer of barbaric which is a fantastic comic series from vault Agreed. and Agreed. i saw that and i saw that cover and i was like oh you know I'm in. I and of course I love the narration. Their narration voice on it is is just it's it's just Michael Morrissey writing great narration, which he does so well. Um, but tell them what's about. So this is the story of a scientist who, much like what we just talked about, also is trying to find a way to uh, bring about immortality. You know, we all want to cheat death. This guy wants to do it. He thinks he has a way to do it. Um, and so he goes to his boss, who's that very villainous billionaire, uh, and is like, hey, I need more money. And the guy's like, I will give you your money if you uh, bring me this girl, my ex-girlfriend, who turns out to be his current lover, uh, the scientist's current lover. So he has to make the decision, do I turn over my girlfriend uh, in exchange for more money? Uh, and he does, like an asshole. And what ends up happening is the guy's like, oh, I'm taking the girl. I'm going to burn all of your work. And I am going to leave you to die here. And in that moment, um, he is um, introduced by uh, these, like, demonic dudes that kind of looks like they're in Jason masks, but... I'm not really sure. They could be demons. Um, and so <clears throat> he is introduced to these characters. Is like, wait a second. After all this time and my moments of dying, I realize that it's my girlfriend who's the most important thing to me. And I need to get back to life to save her. And that is basically what he's going to do. Dude, it was it was intense. I was surprised. I didn't expect it. And then I was like, oh yeah, it's Michael Morrissey. It's 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 barbaric. It's literally like a very similar yeah, like yeah. kind of structure. And I was like kind of like Spawn or The Crow, mm -hmm. where it's like I face death, but now I want to live for love. And your other favorite one, um, oh my god, the one with the the monster that I'm not going to mention on Facebook that you were super uh, the heavy. Oh yeah, yeah also yeah. kind of and and revolver. It was a yes. very similar plot. We've seen it. Yeah. We've seen it a lot. But again, the narration is fantastic. Um, I yeah. realized that I sold my copy of this other Opus comic, so oh, we didn't actually read no it. Way. But there is also no I know, and I totally missed it because I forgot I sold my copy. But Deathgasm. Uh, also from Opus Comics is out this week. We, we, I forgot to give it to Phil because I sold yeah. the copy that I had, but this is number, number one. one. Opus came out with three new books this week. It was a big week for Opus Comics. Uh, I love it because I actually had a customer who bought all of them and then a couple other books, and his total came out to 66.64. So, which meant oh, like nice. he was like, Oh my god, I got all these Opus Comics, which are six dollars and 66 cents every time. Got a bunch of them and some other stuff, and his total still basically came out to 666, so he was like, this is great. This is just an Opus comic week right here. Metal to the core. I mean, look, Opus, you have a fan base, and they will buy all of it. Mm -hmm. I mean... It's true. It doesn't matter what bands you choose, if it's going to be Cradle of Filth or Black Veil Brides or Evanescence. People are here for it. Uh, let's keep this train up. Oh and and they will, because uh, Denton Tipton, who is one of their editors um, in charge, is from Heavy Metal Magazine. So Denton's got a lot of a lot of band connections, and we're going to see this continue. Um, basically, other than Heavy Metal Bands, the only other thing they put out is Frazetta work, uh, because they do have a partnership with the Frazetta Girls, who are in Sarasota. So uh, this is definitely the place for Opus Comics to thrive. 
Uh, Nick said, is this the same publisher who printed Halloween? Yes, this opus yeah. is the Halloween yeah. publisher. <laughs> um, and then... Uh, the bands that they're pulling uh, is something special. <laughs> and then, Who curates that <laughs> magical thing? That magical, and then Ram said, Phil, you need to check out Jag Panzer. If you a Jag Panzer, uh, here, J-A-G-P-A-N-Z-E-R. Uh, that they are another power metal band and they sound epic. So add that to your list from Ram. Oh my god, yeah. The first song is called Harder Than Steel. You, you sold him, Ram. Good job. <laughs> um, we've got a couple more books uh, for the, the weekly t- titles before we get to this week's Picks of the Week. So um, up next from Boom Comics, we have, I guess they're Boom Studios. I always say Boom Comics, but it yeah, is Boom Studios, Boom Studios, just if you didn't know that. Um, and an exclamation point. So maybe put some emphasis on that every once in a while. But this is issue one of Mosley. Yes. Not... Okay, is that the same name as the kid from Jungle Book? No, that's Mowgli. Mowgli. Because I, I saw this cover and I saw Mosley and I was like, oh my god, is this the adult version of that? Like, are we going to get that character but in an adult version? Not at all, this is what we love. <laughs> because that's not the same name at all. <laughs> Maybe that's why. <laughs> yeah. Well, I didn't know that. I just saw Mosley and I was like, that's the kid from Jungle Book. I love you took the time to Google and then like look up all of the bands from the Opus comics, but you didn't think to Google the name of the kid from the Jungle look, Book. Here's the thing: if I was on a game show and someone was like, "What's the name of the kid uh, from Jungle Book?" and I said Mosley, and they were like, "Are you sure?" I'd be like, "Yeah, I'm, a, I'm like 99 percent positive his name is Mosley." That is not this book. Though. That is not. This or is it his name? Not, his, <laughs> not at all what this book is about. No. Um, but this is the story uh, of a, a man and a father and a husband who decides to um, spend a year in this program basically talking to a robot and helping that robot understand humanity and train that robot to kind of be the next step in where this world is going, which is what movies and TV shows and comics has told us, is that we are moving towards a world where AI is going to rule us all. And they've also told us uh, that that's a bad thing. So the fact that he signs up for this program, not so great. And I I feel like this honestly could almost be a sequel to Dark Blood, uh, because that was another book where a man signed up for an experiment and the government used him and threw him out on the street and then blamed him for everything that happened to him kind of what happens in this in this exact story um which are also great allegories for everything else going on in society when you actually read these books um but this man particularly is you know we see him at the end like at the second half of the book really trying to rekindle the relationship uh, that the relationships he missed out on in that time that he spent with robots. And we still don't know because it starts with that one year of him being with the robot. And then it just kind of fast forwards to the time when the robots have taken over. It's like 30 it's years like later. way later. And yeah. so it's like we don't know what happened in that gap yet. And um, I've been reading a, a lot of books this week that just kind of talk about talking about what happens off panel in comics and I thought this book is going to be one of those where we're constantly talking about what happened off panel because we did go from him training like the first conversation with him training a robot to a world where everybody is embedded with robot culture and he's the only one he's it's essentially like the 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 older generations now who are like I don't need a cell phone I don't need to be on that but he's like I don't need to have a robot I don't need to be connected to robots. Like, my hands work just fine. I don't need to be connected to that. I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to be around it. Um, And yet, uh, there is a twist at the end of issue one that definitely sets us up for an incredibly great story coming forward. Um, And it's boom, so it's going to be good. But it's definitely a great setup where at the end you're like, did not know that's where this was going. And yet, kind kind of not surprised. I wasn't expecting it either, but I'm, I'm totally here for it. Um, this wasn't the comic I was expecting, but it gave me everything that I wanted. Um, very much like, uh, like I robot Mm -hmm. or, um, there's another movie out of my mind, but I robot was kind of the first one that came to my mind. 
Um, right now, I'm just going to read this in Alan Tudyk's voice forever, which is how life should be. I'll read it most everything in Alan Tudyk's voice. A hundred percent. If everything in life could be narrated by Alan Tudyk, the world would be a better place for most people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Also, 2023, can I get can I get a comic about the adult version of... Mowgli, Mowgli from the Jungle Book, Thank whose you. name is still not Mosley, no matter what Phil thinks it is. <laughs> um, Let me get that. In 2023. I want to see what he went on to do with his life. I think he marries the little girl from the village. Show me that. Yeah. The little see, girl with the water Let jug. me see him have his kid, and then that kid goes into the jungle. Does he grow up to be Brendan Fraser in George of the Jungle? Absolutely because... not. <laughs> <laughs> Brendan Fraser in George not. of the Jungle is the greatest thing ever. How dare you? Stop it. How Stop it. dare you? Stop it. That is an amazing movie. Okay, first of all, that is... That is beautiful. We always talk about how the mummy, like, created a generation of bisexual people. But George of the Jungle stars Brendan Fraser still looking as hot as he does is Rick O'Connell. But then you also add Leslie Mann. And we don't talk about how hot Leslie Mann is as a society enough. Um, because Leslie Mann is a beautiful, beautiful woman. And we don't we don't discuss that as a society. And I feel like we are doing a disservice to Leslie Mann. So Leslie Mann, if you're listening, I love you. And I think you should be on top 10 list everywhere um, for how hot you are. And George of the Jungle should rank just as high as the mummy for turning people into loving both gen- both sexes because Leslie Mann and Rachel Weisz, you're all, you're all hot. Anyway. It also made me think that everybody who uh, would eat coffee beans would go crazy because of the scene where he eats the coffee beans and can't control his stuff anymore. Anyway, I love that movie. George of the Jungle is fantastic. Brendan Fraser is a national treasure. Keep him safe. Um, up next, from Marvel, I know we just talked about how we don't talk about a lot of big two books, but if you thought I wasn't going to talk about this book, you don't know me at all. Um, issue one of Scarlet Witch is out, which is written by Steve Orlando. Um, I'm very excited to have Wanda have a book because the last couple of years we've seen Wanda show up just for all of the Marvel Universe to blame her for all of their problems, which I think is a load of crap, first of all. Um, you have a lot of your own problems because you need to learn to deal with your own business, Marvel characters. Um, but in this book, we find out that Wanda feels bad for all of the things that she's done over the course of time because Marvel has always given Wanda the worst possible story arcs that they could give her to be a good person. Um, so she's decided that she is going to open up uh, essentially a witch bookstore, an apothecary, you know, the kind of stores you see pretty much everywhere these days. And she's doing it with Darcy, who you may know as Kat Dinnings from the MCU. Darcy is her assistant running the store for her. Um, she seemed fo- okay that that's makes her sense. it's Darcy um, and Darcy this is actually Darcy's first appearance in continuity oh, so spec book spec book all over the place on eBay. I, I think it actually is um, but uh, oh this is uh, <laughs> Darcy uh, and and Wanda are running the store and Pietro Quicksilver shows up and is kind of making fun of Wanda the whole time for wanting to have this mundane store and she's like hey I've done a lot of bad according to everybody and you know I start I kind of think I did so um this is my way of making amends I've built this magical door in the back of the building and basically anybody who is having a problem can show up to this door the door will find them they walk through the door I help them so this is the setup obviously for the fact that that's basically each issue is almost going to be anthology-esque of Wanda helping people um, as we see the overarching story being Wanda trying to uh, make amends for all the things that she's done and just kind of put her magic to good use. If you're a Scarlet Witch fan, read it. This is a great jumping in point, honestly, for Scarlet Witch fans because she did kind of she is kind of like, hey, I did some stuff. Doesn't really matter. Now I'm doing new stuff. Um, and she kind of says that right at the beginning. I will also say... The first, like, four pages of this book are incredibly cheesy. Uh, I was like, where are we going, Steve Orlando? Because I trust you and don't, don't, don't steer me wrong. Um, And so it's kind of a little bit of cheesy, like, back and forth banter between her and Pietro. And it's almost a little kiddish, which is kind of endearing when you get to the end because you do, you know, they are twins and they have, like, that relationship and they're kind of teasing each other. So it kind of works out, but it does 
once you get past that and you do kind of get into the heart of the story, it's it's going to be a great Wanda story. Um, and I'm, I'm excited. We haven't had a solo Wanda story since that incredible one that had all the David Aja covers. Oh, yeah. God. Yeah. Uh, which I just learned the artist on that went to Ringling and we had her professors in here the nice. other day. So uh, that was a great... Great uh, Scarlet Witch story, but this is the first solo story for Scar uh, Wanda that we've had since then, and I'm very excited because I'm a huge Scarlet Witch fan. Um, it's too hot to be wearing my sweater, which was my original plan for this experience. <laughs> um, and then lastly, before we get to Pace of the Week, which honestly, this is one of those books that for me verged on that title. Um, this is Gangster Ass Barista number one from Black Mass Comics. Um, which we don't hear a lot from. They're very selective at Black Mask of what yeah. they put out. Uh, but this is Pat Shan, who does Destiny of New York also for Black Mask Comics, and they are a really, really great creator. I love the things that uh, I love the things that we got out of Destiny New York, are still getting out of Destiny New York, and um, this is a great story. I actually had a couple of people who have worked at Starbucks in their past come in and get this book this week because they needed to have these first couple of pages where um, our former gangster slash robber uh, who's had a CD past is now working as a barista at a coffee shop. And her first couple of pages are kind of just like, working at a coffee shop sucks. Like, here are all the reasons working at a coffee shop sucks. And you know, you're like, anybody who's worked in any kind of service industry in those first couple of pages, you're like, yep, yeah. mm-hmm, get it. I get all, I get all of this from the the guy who's trying to be the, the know-it-all in the like, oh, well, the rule book says you have to handle your shift like this. Why aren't your coffees this hot instead of this hot? And I was like, I want to punch that guy. Yeah. I'll punch that guy real hard. Um, and then uh, you get this story where some people come in. There's a fight between customers. Suddenly there's a giant bag of money on the ground. And old habits die hard. Yeah. Yeah, this was, uh, you know, this is one of those where I feel like I've seen this set up a million times. The uh, Someone stumbled into a big bag of money that may not, may or may not be attached to some bad people. Um, but I kind of like this too because it kind of sets up that, hey, there's a lot to this person's past um that we are going to slowly see unravel and it's kind of interesting too because she works in service industry and there's kind of this you know kind of a little bit of a conversation of like hey maybe be nice to the people who are behind the counter but she's also kind of a dick yeah she kind of is and so it's one of those where like i like this character but I also think if I worked with her, I'd be like, God, I hate her so much. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would fall where the manager falls, where I'm like, hey, that guy over there, he's kind of he's kind of obnoxious, I know. Yeah. Like, but at the same but time, chill. like, chill out. Yeah, like, I, I definitely identified with the manager character the most yeah. in the story, uh, probably from doing the retail management position, where you're like, I'm trying, like, especially because they get the robbery, and then they get, like, the fight, and then they get, like, the police, and they get all this stuff, and he's like, why is it always, always on my shift? Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, I feel that so hard, where it's like every shift I ever had in retail, I'm like, why is all the bad stuff happening when I'm here? And, like, yeah. um, so I definitely uh, got that, but I do love... The, the tagline on the back is regular, it's not a size. Because that's the opening. I yeah. love that opening yeah. because people just keep coming in and they're like, I'll take a regular of this. And she's like, we have small, medium, and large. And they're like, yeah, I want a regular. And she's like, we have small, medium, and large. And they're like, well, everybody knows a regular is this. Or, well, I'll take a regular anyway. And she's like, I, I'm good. I, I mean, look, yes. <laughs> in the world of... of food service yes a regular is technically a medium yes but if i don't use the word regular don't order a regular don't say regular if i say would you want a small medium or large if you want the medium just say medium. it's not that hard just say medium it's remember the people behind the counter are not getting paid enough money to deal with you arguing with them on semantics. Yeah. Just order the like the thing in the way they said it. I can also just not serve you your coffee. 
if I chose to. <laughs> I could easily too. just be like, you know what? No coffee for you today. Go somewhere else. No soup for you. Um, but yeah, I, I really like this first issue. Mm-hmm. I think it's a good kickoff. Uh, I was a little nervous with a name like Gangster Ass Barista. I was like, I don't know if I like the name of this, but what's inside the book was was really great. It's definitely like if you elongated Caffeinated Hearts into an ongoing series. Yeah. Uh, maybe yeah. not as touching as the ending of Caffeinated Hearts no. was, but definitely that day-to-day life uh, turning into a bigger story. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's going to be I think it's gonna be good to check out. Uh, so yeah. far, Pat Shan has not let me down because Destiny in New York has been stellar the whole way through. I never read through. Destiny in New York. It's still going. They, they actually really? said that they wrote over 40 issues as a webcomic. Wow. And then, so, and then Black Mask picked it up. So we're only on th- issue 13 in print format. Okay. So we got a long way to go, and I'm excited for it. If you don't know, Destiny in New York is, um, basically, there's a school for people who were the chosen ones. Like, literally, a non-Harry Potter, Harry Potter shows up in the thing. Um, and it's basically, they teach you how to fulfill your prophecy, and then it's like, oh, after you fulfill your prophecy, you're supposed to go on and do something else with your life, except none of, uh, or except our main character fulfilled their prophecy when they were 11, and then never went on to do anything with their life, so they're still kind of stuck at the school, like, what do I do? Uh, great book. Um, all right, so we got two picks of the week, basically, I would say one for each of us, but I actually picked both of them, so that's not really fair. I mean, Phil picked one, but... I agree with both choices. Yeah, you asked me what my pick of the yeah. week was. And then I was like, well, I was already going to put that in there. So uh, why don't you go first? Yes. First up, we have Matt Kent's new book. This is Spy Superb. If you like espionage, if you like spies and the world of spies, then this is the book for you. Uh, this is a great premise because there are a ton of spy stories out there. And this is basically the U.S., and um, France. France team up together and create the ultimate spy. But then imagine on the first mission, that ultimate spy blew himself up. And instead of train spending all this time training a new one and finding that perfect spy, what if we just tell the world we have the best spy and he's not actually the best buy. And it turns out instead they're just using a bunch of civilians to complete all these missions without actually knowing that they're completing these missions. So they're dropping envelopes into mailboxes and they're picking up cell phones and they're doing all these drops and different things. That they have absolutely no idea is tied uh, to the government or spy related things. And in this one, the story kicks off with the person, the civilian, who at the moment is what they call the spy superb, um, dies. And so they have to move on to their next target. (laughs) The next person in line (laughs) is a real piece of work. So when I told Phil the premise of this book, this he, he J. literally the third. <laughs> he rolled his eyes at me when I told him the premise of the book, and I laughed because I was like, he's gonna come back and tell me it's his pick of the week, and then oh, he yeah. did, yeah. and it was great because I knew you were gonna love J. Bartholomew the third. Yes, he uh, is a, a writer who we're gonna put that in is writing his mag- magnus opus at this point. <laughs> Which is a thousand pages long, so writers everywhere you and can laugh at that. Mm-hmm. Multiple years of this guy. God, I wish I could remember the premise of the book, um, but it's like a sci-fi. Uh, was it Prowse? That's the guy he talks about. Oh my god! But it, he tries to like sit there and explain in depth what this book is about and how it's going to be the next best thing, and how he offered the first chapter to a woman in a bookstore, and instead she bought that. You know, Nicholas the, Sparks book. Yeah, like your run of the mill, whatever Oprah put on her book list. I love him because, once again, one of those characters you immediately get everything about because I have worked in in writing and in in publishing and in bookstores for so long that when he and and you also love to write so. When you get that character who immediately is like, oh, well, I'm going to send my first chapter. I've sent my first chapter to every publisher and my book's going to be a thousand pages long. And he even is sitting there at the table with somebody who has actually completed their novel and is already talking to agents and things. And he's like, well, I'd love to give you some advice, but you're not ready. You're not where I'm at yet. And you've had 
had those conversations if you've ever been in the writing world and you're just you you cringe hearing this man talk like I was laughing so hard because I was like oh my god I know him I know 1700 of him I've met them throughout my life this is incredible I cannot wait to see how terribly bad he messes up everything and then you get to those points and I'm like (laughs) yeah I knew this was gonna happen um I also want this to be a tv show or a movie and he would have to kind of uh, get in a bit of shape. I don't know the actor's name. I can't now remember his character's name, but he's from Kim's. It's the Hispanic dude in Kim's Convenience. Oh my god, the one that wants, that the wants can to be the best bottom? friends. He wants to be best friends yeah. with Mr. Kim. Who who tries to get the cans when Kim the, Chi. Kim Chi. No, not no. not not the guy not that not Simu Lu's best friend. The guy that's the, the one customer. That, the one that wants the can out of the bottle. Oh, and yeah. He, and Mr. Mr. Kim's like, I'm not going to get Enrique. you. Enrique yes, is the name Enrique. of the character, but yes. I can't remember the That's actor. That's the name of the character. He 100%, that is this character. Yeah. Uh, oh, my God. Now that you said that, it makes the story That's even all I could text. imagine. I read it. Yeah, <laughs> when you I have saw to him, read it. I was like, "That's the that would be the actor I would want to play you, this role. And 100%. so I just read his character. I just read this character in his voice. Oh my god. And it's great. And as much as I want you to read this, I now want you all to go home and watch Kim's Convenience. I just went back and rewatched it. It's the greatest show. I love it so much. It's so good. So good. If you love Shang-Chi, Simu Lu is actually like his breakout role was Kim's Convenience. So please. And he's great. He's He's fantastic. But it is like one of the best cast of characters because there's so many characters in that show that are just wonderful. Um, And the dad is playing Uncle Iroh in the uh, live action uh, Avatar show. Which is the greatest casting you could ever do. He is the only person I can imagine playing a live action Iroh and doing a good job. Um, I support that. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not sure I support the show yet. We'll see. The last live action well, Avatar, The Last Airbender. better than the M. Night Shyamalan movie. I could make a better version than the M. Night Shyamalan movie. That's true. So. Spy Superb. Spy Number Superb. Number one, Dark Horse. Matt Kent. If you're reading Berserker and you're enjoying it, know that Matt Kent is the big voice behind that, and this is a great choice to like figure out what Matt Kent does on his own. Um, it's it's the best. Um, also, I have two copies on the shelf. Other than that one, because we sold out of that book at one point, nice. and what all we had left was what I had left for somebody to decide which cover they wanted. So that was, and that was on Wednesday. By the end of Wednesday, I had an empty hole. Um, until yesterday yeah. when somebody decided. So, spice superb. Um, speaking of books that I've mostly sold out of this week, uh, this is Children of the Black Sun number one from Ablaze Comics. This is the Something is Killing the Children homage variant. So, um, don't know if you know this, I was obsessed with Village of the Dam as a, as a teenager. I don't know when it came out. Uh, the, the remake, obviously, I was not alive when the original came out. Um, I was obsessed with that book, and, or that movie, and this kind of reminded me of that going into it. But this is um, basically that and Umbrella Academy mixed together. This is the story of our society has a blackout of the sun, and then four years later, it happens again. And it's more than an eclipse. It's like the sun blacks out for a long, like a day or a week at a time. And uh, I guess it's a day. Yeah, it lasts uh, for a day. It lasts for a day. And all of the kids who are born on the day the sun blacked out are called Children of the Black Sun. Um, we get a great history of it by a child in a, in a school who is doing a report. And I love him because it's almost like having Waterboy yeah. give you the information of the back, the exposition of this comic because he's like, Mama said I'm not allowed yeah. to talk to those people. So Mama said this would all be okay if everyone loved Jesus. Yeah, you get a lot of the Mama said moments, mm-hmm. um, which is really funny to give you a kickoff at the beginning of the book. But then you find out that there are children who were born under that black sun, and there are two generations there. So the generation that was born under the first black sun, which was four years before the second black sun. And we kind of are following a kid of the second black sun. And he seems to just kind of have the best interest at heart for everybody in the world. And he kind of sticks up for everybody who's getting bullied for being a a child of the black sun uh, because everybody bullies them in every capacity. And uh, while he is trying to stand up for some bullies in this issue, we meet some children of the original Black Sun. And there is a stark difference between the way 
uh, personality of the children of the first black son and the personality of the children of the second black son. And I need to know everything. Uh, I read this book at 1.30 in the morning, the night like of new, like the morning of new comic book day, essentially, um, because I everybody always asks me, what are the new number ones about, Shannon? And I'm always like, I don't know. I ordered them two months ago. So and so, like, I don't remember. And so I was like, I'm going to read all the number ones. And I read this one because of the something is killing the children homage and the crazy name of children of the black sun. And I was like, oh, two and a blaze. But like three things that speak to me. Something is killing the children. It's a blaze. Something is killing the children. A blaze. Children of the Black Sun. All things that were like, I need to read this book. And I was like, <laughs> I was already on like Wednesday morning, 1 a.m. Like, okay, well, I already know what pick of the week is. There we go. Here we are. And uh, seriously, TikTok a blaze. When's this choo choo coming out? Because I got to know how dark this is going to get. Um, and also, I want to know what happens to that kid whose mama said he can't talk to the children. Yeah, let's follow that kid. That's the spinoff. I need yeah. a one shot of that kid's life because he's going to have a rough time coming into the whatever happens in the series. Because yes. he kind of shows up here and there and things don't go well for him ever. No. Mm -mm. And you kind of also don't really care. You're kind of like, yeah, maybe. You deserve him. Maybe you deserve this. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think this is going to be good. Mm -hmm. um, I enjoyed this first issue a lot, so I'm, I'm excited to see where it goes. It's going to be a fun, fun universe. Also, you know, is that Black Sun going to come back? Oh, I know, because that's the whole thing we're all worried about right now is will there be another Black Sun? I don't know. And also, I'm not going to lie, if you listen, since we're talking about like crazy rock and metal bands, if you just want to play Black Hole Sun while you're reading You know it, what? Every time I saw this cover and I saw that, I immediately started singing that song in my head. <laughs> it's fair. It's fair. Great I don't song. know. I don't know what to do. Wonderful All right. song. All right. We got some in stocks. Some other books that came out this week, uh, we're not going to talk about necessarily in detail, but uh, we're going to start out with uh, Scotch McTiernan is back with a holiday party. This is Scotch McTiernan doing A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. If you saw his Halloween party, now we're up to the holidays and we're doing A Christmas Carol and it's ridiculous. Uh, also, a one shot that Bill could have put on his list of best books probably for last year, The Secret History of Weed. Yes. Scott McTiernan. Happy. Same creative team. Yeah. Um, Dark Knights of Steel issue 9 of 12. We just got into a big giant war and things just got really, really messy. Uh, Venom issue 14. This is part of your dark web storyline. So if you're collecting all of that, this is a, a piece you need. Uh, X-Force issue 35. We've got X-Men Red issue 10 with Storm's demonized variant, which is nice. dope. Um, Armageddon Game, The Alliance from TMNT. This is issue three of The Alliance of the Armageddon Game. We also have the regular <laughs> TMNT and the TMNT, The Armageddon Game. There's a lot going on in the world right now. Uh, Sword of Azrael, issue six. Don't worry, it's in your box already. I think it's the last issue, too. It is. It is the final issue of that. Star Wars, issue 30. This is the action figure variant. Um, Stillwater, issue 17 from Chuck wow. Zdarsky. It is still going on. People ask me all the time, what is Stillwater? So I feel like I need to tell you. Uh, Stillwater is about a town where nobody can die. And a man and his friend wander into that town. And the man finds out he is more connected to that town than he could have ever have imagined. And that's what Stillwater is about. It's great. It is great. It's Chuck Zdarsky. Of course yeah. it's great. Um, anything Chip Sadarsky also, like Public Domain could have really made the top 22 of 22. I thought it was going to be in your, it, it was, I thought about it. It was close. It was, it, I don't know. I, again, I struggled. Um, Shang-Chi, uh, actually called Master of the Ten Rings, issue one, but really this is the final of the, of the Shang-Chi series that is going on right now. They changed the name just for like the last issue because he's mastered them it has been him trying to master the ten rings now he has done it congratulations hey. shang chi um secret invasion issue three is out nick before you ask i already saved you a copy of secret invasion issue three and uh i got i got you uh marauders issue 10 is out so all week long all the marvel books had an homage variant and I love this one because everybody has homage to Days of Future Past in the last year and a half. Every, everybody, literally the whole entire world, has homage to Days of Future Past. But this is 
the Marauders. So it's Wolverine and Kitty Pride on a Days of Future Past cover. And I was like, we finally did it. We finally homaged. This is like the children who go back and recreate as adults the picture like that they took when they were kids. This is this is that moment like where you and your siblings recreate that childhood picture yeah. that you love so much as adults. This is it. We finally did it. Uh, so we don't need any more days of future past homages moments. It's done. We've we've. But we'll get we've, more. We'll get a thousand more. But that should be the pinnacle of where yeah. we need to go. Uh, Joe Fixit is back. Uh, I guess it's it's here. This is his first ever solo series. Yes. Um, and it's Peter David writing it. I know. I saw that, and I'm now curious. Yeah, this is one that, um, if you're a Peter David Hulk fan, you need to pick this up because this is Peter David writing Joe Fix It. He's back in Vegas. He's doing gangstery things. Huh. Joe, Joe Fix It <laughs> feels like putting I, that aside. I, I want to read it. I yeah. definitely want to read it. Uh, Fantastic Four. This is the Ryan North Alex Ross. Um, covered beautiful thing for uh, Fantastic Four. I know a lot of people have been waiting for this Ryan North Fantastic Four. It's been great. Um, Planet Hulk World Breaker issue three. This is Greg Pak's of uh, uh, Planet Hulk story. Um, which of course now everybody's like, oh, we're gonna get a Planet Hulk story in the MCU, and I'm like, they still don't have full rights to the Hulk. Stop yeah. thinking you're getting. Also, we already had a Planet Hulk movie. It was supposed to be Ragnarok, and it was Planet Hulk. That's another, again, another live stream that I'm not allowed to have. Um, Captain Marvel issue 45, the return of the Brood, back uh, through Captain Marvel. So, excellent fans, the Brood's back. Uh, Captain America, Symbol of Truth, number eight, is out this week. Batman, issue 131. This is Chip Zdarsky on Batman. Apparently, there is a new character who's introduced in this issue <gasps> that people are freaking out about. So, now a chance to grab that. Um, also, out this week was Joker. Uh, the Joker who, who, the man who stopped laughing. Um... And every, it was issue four, and allegedly the big controversy was that, like, DC went woke because they had the Joker get pregnant. Calm down. It's all magic. Don't freak out. Uh, and actually read the story, maybe, before you comment on the internet. Just it's saying. I'm sure. No, that's not it. <laughs> it's a different character. Different, different altogether. Uh, Avengers are out with issue 64. That is still ongoing. Uh, Walking Dead Deluxe issue 54 is out starting, I believe it's like next week or the week after. We're going to see Invincible Undeluxe, which is where we are going to black and white all of the Invincible issues instead of colorizing them. Uh, where Starships Go to Die issue 5, the wrap up of that title from Aftershock. Star Trek issue 3, this is the new ongoing Star Trek ish uh, series. Gold Goblin issue three. This is the homage cover for that series, and this is a, a tie-in to your dark web story. So make sure you grab that. Um, and then Ultraman: The Mystery of the Ultra Seven issue five. Nick, I got you on this one too. Don't you worry, my dude. You have an Ultraman in your box. Um, but that is what we got out this week. I didn't even. I didn't even bring. I didn't bring trades. Oh my god! Wait, because the greatest trade ever is out this week, and I failed. Talk amongst yourselves, internet. Um. Hey, internet. It's your pal Philip. Just patiently waiting for Shannon to bring some trades for y'all to check out. Um. You're doing a great job. I yeah. You. you know. Um. This is my forte. This is. You know, this banter. is what I, I, yeah, banter is the thing I'm best at. It's definitely not, and I appreciate it. It's fine. It's what I scored the highest on my SATs was in banter. <laughs> oh, man. If that was a subject on the SATs, I would have had a perfect score. Because <laughs> 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 that's all I'm good at is bantering. Um, things that came out in trade format this week. Spider-Man, the first 60 years. This, this celebrates the one you were no, about this year. isn't the one. Yeah, well, this was... is Origins. <laughs> I'm going to save the best for last. Calm down, people. This is Origins, Allies, Villains, and all kinds of things from Spider-Man. They also have 80 years of Marvel Comics, 80 years of Captain America. They have like a first 30 years of Deadpool and a first 60 years of uh, Fantastic Four. So if you're a Spider-Man fan and you need a collection, this is it. Um, the other thing out this week is Volume 2 of Good Boy is out. This was where Good Boy got intense. Uh, it is basically the story of 
if you reverse John Wick, this is a dog who is anthropomorphic, whose master gets killed, and who was basically John Wick, and uh, now he goes out and is trying to avenge his master by killing everybody. But issue uh, volume two, which is this, is him going to the farm. <laughs> uh, he didn't die. Calm down. Don't worry. Um, but this is <laughs> that really philosophical for a book about a dog going after people who killed his master. So this is intense. I'm going to show you these ones that Matt just went and grabbed really fast. Um, uh, we have epic collections back in stock, including the volume one of Amazing Spider-Man. So this is um, 60 years ago, last year. Spider-Man debuted in Marvel Comics. This is that 1962 through 1964 volume one of Spider-Man. This does include Amazing Fantasy 15, as well as Spider-Man 1 through 17 and the first annual uh, issue of Spider-Man, which is the appearance of the Sinister Six, which you can buy behind me on this wall right there. Um... <laughs> But if you are wanting to get into Spider-Man and you uh, have never read it before, these are beautifully remastered versions um, of all those issues. Epic collections usually have like 20, 30 issues in them, depending on the Epic collection. And you get to kind of go back and just relive those great moments. Matt has a wall of them in the store that he uses as reference. And uh, this is definitely one of them that I know a lot of people have been waiting on. Is that this was out of print for, what, two years? Uh, and Matt went through a lot of trouble to get his copy. And now you can just walk into the store and ask for one. I have it. So, um, Also back in stock is volume one of the Fantastic Four. So if you want to see Sue Storm pass out unnecessarily, here it is. Um, this they is your... so, her so dirty. In the beginning well, of this series. Well, because Chantley isn't good at writing women back in those days. Let's be honest. Um, <laughs> However, at the same time, though, my love for the Fantastic Four stems from this early stuff. Oh, absolutely. Because the most important... Yeah. Right, Jack Kirby's art. And the second most important thing after that is the introduction of the Inhumans comes from the early days of Fantastic Four. Medusa came very early on. And then uh, you get the rest of them coming in in 46 and beyond. Um, so, you know, this is issues one through 18 of Fantastic Four. Again, I apologize on behalf of Marvel Comics for the way Sue Storm was treated, but the rest of the story is great. Also um, probably one of the greatest villains in comic book history. Oh, yeah, and you get that issue five where Dr. Doom comes in for the very first time in comics so ever, awesome. which is, I mean, unless you're so referring awesome. to Mole Man in issue one. Yeah, so, was, I, was, I figured. Was. I'm sorry. I, I, I jumped the gun. Um, but uh, we have some incredible villains coming through Fantastic Four. That is the first family of Marvel Comics right here. Um, and Mar uh, Fantastic Four number one, first comic actually under the name Marvel. So if you want to have some Marvel history, grab this and jump into the beginning of Marvel Comics and Stanley not being just an intern, but actually being a writer. Mm. Um, Is the first appearance of Namor in... First appearance in the Silver Age of Fantastic Four. Oh, okay. Because he was a Tells to Astonish character? Where was he? No, it was Marvel Comics 1. Marvel Comics Oh, one? yeah, okay. that's right. He was in the old Captain America stuff. Yeah, he was, well, that's, that's Tells. Isn't it? Was it Captain America? No. Uh, Captain America was timely. Timely. Yeah, but timely. where was the timely title that he was under? Captain Marvel. America. Marvel Comics. It was Marvel one. Comics. I believe it's his first and mm. Human Torch's first. Yeah, I think so. Think. Mm-hmm. checking right now. Yes, I am. Yeah, I was always him. curious about that because yeah. I, uh, I, I remember seeing him. That was my introduction to Namor was those early Fantastic Four. I mean, issues. technically his first appearance is Captain America comics. So. Yeah, that's what it was. But I thought it, one of the tales, too, was turned into the Captain America title. And when Captain America 100 came out of one of the... Tales of Suspense. Tales yeah, of, Tales of Suspense. Thank you. That's what I was trying to get at. I was like, Tales to Astonish and Tales to... Uh, so his first appearance was... Captain America comics number one. Number one. See, I thought it was three for some weird reason. I had the number three in my mind, but yeah. Captain America Comics number one. That's crazy. I want to see one of those. I, I want I've them, never seen that. Well, I, I'd even like to see them like reprint those early issues because the art in those books wild. They won't. I don't know if they can. <laughs> they have or they haven't. They have not. They have those timely comics. Can they though? Technically, no, I, I don't think so. I don't know where the rights are. There's a whole thing about Joe Can we Simon. Buy the rights? Still, there's a whole thing about the Joe Simon lawsuit on the Captain America like mm. history. 
So, but according to this, Captain America Comics number one was his first film. And while we're at it, Captain America was created by Joe Simon and Jack Kirby and not Stan Lee. Let's just all reference that really fast to make sure we're all clear. So I'm going to start a Kickstarter to raise money to buy the rights to Timely Comics. And by donating money, you will get a collected edition of all of the timeless stuff. There you go. I mean, honestly, do that. You're just going to have to buy it out of Marvel. So anyway, the, co- the trade I, I went know to... I some people. You, no, you don't. Can I borrow a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, thing I actually ran to go get was the new oh, volume man. of Canto came out. Uh, Canto tells the unnamed world... If you have watched this show for any number of years, you may know that Canto is one of my favorite comics to exist of all time. Um, I'm, I'm still waiting for my plushie, Build the Bear. Seriously, this is entirely a character who needs a heart. Uh, I don't know why you're not making it. It's adorable and, and wonderful, but this is the story of a group of knights who were enslaved and their hearts were stolen by a sorcerer and the young knight Canto, who is named by his friend, he's the first knight in the group to be named, uh, decides that because he has a name, it is up to him to go out and find the hearts of all of his fellow people and stop the sorcerer. And in this particular volume, Canto is actually, um, I'm going to show you, I guess I can show you. Oh my God, that maze is great. Uh, Canto is, you want to hold it? Uh, sure. Canto is actually working to, um, he has to tell a story. They have met a person who won't let them continue on their journey unless they can tell a story that he's never heard before. And uh, Canto determines that his whole thing has been storytelling. And the problem is, is that this person has heard all of Canto's stories. And so over the course of this book, Canto has to come to terms with what story he can tell. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's kind of a segue. It's not really considered Canto Volume 3 or Volume 4 or wherever we are in the Canto lore. But if you haven't read Canto yet, it's the greatest fairy tale of all time. Just saying. You should read it. It's beautiful. Yeah. So that was the trade that I went to go get. Sorry. Uh, I also didn't didn't pull what comes out this week. So give me two seconds while I pull this really fast. Um, I get to banter more. You do. You're so good at it. Uh, so I recently read uh, Karen Gillan's Darth Vader run. It's fantastic. Uh, if you're a Star Wars fan, I stopped liking Star Wars for a while, but Andor brought me back in. Oh, which I've heard is fantastic. Uh, I haven't seen it yet. It's so good. I really enjoy it. I like that character. Also, I didn't realize very much like the Mowgli Mosley. Uh, I thought the show was going to be about the planet Endor. <laughs> No, so I was like three Andor, episodes the, in the waiting guy for you watch. I didn't know that. I had no bad, idea. Bad so I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, I know at some point Ewoks are gonna show up, but who is this guy? And then eventually I was like, oh wait a second, this is the Rogue One prequel, which was a terrible name for him because we did already have a planet called yeah. Endor. I agree, that was, was bad marketing. Too, too it's too close. close. Yeah, it's too close. Great character, great actor. Uh, can't uh, wait. I loved it. It was a great show. I need to see it. Uh, um, but yeah, sorry. Books out this week. No, that was a great segue. Good. See, that was good banter. I'm proud of yeah. you. Uh, books out this week. Something is killing the children. <laughs> Twenty eight is out. Um, Human Target number ten. I know people are always waiting to see when Human Target is going to come out again. Uh, Gunslinger Spawn number sixteen. Predator number six. Uh, Grim number seven. We've already we're like two issues into that volume two now. Uh, the Lazarus Planet saga is starting for DC. So if you were reading Dark Crisis on Infinite Earths, everything was destroyed. Now the Lazarus planet is happening. I'm not really sure how a whole planet can basically be a Lazarus pit, but I do know that according to the solicitations, Mercy is getting powers, who is the, if you've seen the animated, Superman animated cartoon, she's Lex Luthor's uh, driver and Mm -hmm. assistant, and she is somehow getting powers, so I don't care. I don't care what you do. You gave Mercy superpowers, and I've been waiting for that my entire life, so I'm here for it. Uh, Little Monsters number nine is out this week. Danger Street issue two. I know you just read issue one. Um, 10,000 Black cop. Feathers number five is out. Heck yes. Blood Stained Teeth number eight. Yeah. Uh, the new Monica Rambo series issue two is out. Time Before Time 19 is out. Dark Ride number four is out, which is fantastic. Joshua Williamson book. Um, the Dead Lucky number five. Black Cloak from Image number one is launching this week. 
Um, what else? Nemesis Reloaded, which is the new Mike Mark Millar from the Millar World imprint uh, at Image. Specs number three is out. What's up, Chris Sheehan and my writer of Canto? Uh, this is a, it's a team that I'm in love with. Um, all Against All issue two is out this week. That is your Christian Ward book. Or no, your uh, Casper Wingard. Sorry, yeah, not yeah. Christian Ward, Casper Wingard. Uh, Moon Grown Sub Dinosaur issue two. Know Your Station from Boom Studios issue two is out. The Ones issue three. We've been waiting for that. Mindset issue six is out. Thank you, Vault. I'm going to pretend like you heard me earlier and you just announced it right now. Uh, Masquerade issue four from Kevin Smith's line at Dark Horse. Two Graves number three. Uh, at least we can do number five is out gospel number three crashing number five we were watching earlier you know that's one of my picks of the year uh and after end number five from about comics uh common writer zero one number two is out assassin's apprentice number two from dark horse which was a great issue one i cannot wait um we've got billionaire island cult of dogs revolvers number three uh godzilla revivals or Godzilla Rivals, the Rodan issue is out this week. Just saying, Fine. that's for Matt. That's his pick of the week already. Right. <laughs> uh, that's Matt's favorite. <laughs> Dead Kingdom issue four from Red Five. Dream Master issue two from Jonathan Hedrick and uh, Black Box. Congrats, Jonathan. Issue two coming out. My Little Pony number three. Stray Sheep number one from Blood Moon Comics is coming out. I'm very excited. Life and Death of the Brave Captain Swab issue four from Scout is out this week. West Moon Chronicles issue two finally out. Uh, the creator had told me it was out like a month ago, and I was like, it's not, and I'm waiting. So I'm glad it's finally here. Uh, Lost Souls Hair Haywire issue one. Um, Thud issue. Double Vision issue two is out. Uh, we love Thud. Uh, Phil and I do. Um, uh, I think that's it. That looks like most of it. So there's a lot of cool books that are out this week. Big week. Uh, yeah, it's going to be fun. I'm excited. It sounds like it's a big week for indie, honestly, yeah. more so than the big two, which I love when those weeks happen. Um, it's going to be great. I'm excited. We'll see. Uh, Wednesday's going to be a lot of fun, which is when we will probably see you here in shop at Bad City Comics to pick up your new comics. If we don't see you on Wednesday, and even if we do, maybe we'll catch you next Sunday night at 9 when we wind down your weekend and talk about all of the hot new titles for that week that we love. Hopefully you love too. Thanks for tuning in as we talked about our favorite books for 2022. It was a great year for comics. I cannot wait to see what the Eisner nominations are. Yeah. It's already going to be too hard of a year to vote. We struggled really hard to pick. We gave ourselves 22 books and we still struggled on it. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to struggle a little bit to vote for some Eisners this year. It was a great year. I can't wait. 2023 is going to be even better. Buy indie comics. Read comic books. Have an incredible year. We're here for it. It's going to be amazing. We will see you on Wednesday for a new comic book day. And if not, we'll see you next Sunday to wind down your weekend. Bye. Bye.